the african verdict from leaves of antiquity or the poetry of the hebrew tradition by johann gottfried herder seventeen forty four to eighteen hundred and three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. alexander of macedonia once entered into a neighboring and wealthy province of africa the inhabitants came forth to meet him and brought him their robes filled with golden apples and fruits eat this fruit among yourselves said alexander i am not come to see your wealth but to learn your customs they then conducted him to the market where their king administered justice a citizen just then came before him and said i have bought of this man o king a sack full of chaff and have found in it a secret treasure the chaff is mine but not the gold and this man will not take it again command him o king that he receive it for it is his own and his antagonist a citizen also of the place answered thou fearest to retain anything unjustly and should not i also fear to receive such a thing from thee i have sold thee the sack with all that was in it keep it for it is thine command him o king the king inquired of the first one if he had a son he answered yes he inquired of the other if he had a daughter and the same answer yes was returned well then said the king you are both just men marry your children to each other and give them the discovered treasure as a marriage portion that is my verdict alexander was astonished when he heard this decision have i judged unjustly said the king of this remote country that thou art thus astonished not at all answered alexander but in our country they would have judged far otherwise and how then would they have judged inquired the african king both parties would have lost their heads answered alexander and their treasure would have fallen into the hands of the king then the king clasped his hands together and said does the sun then shine upon you and do the heavens still shower their rain upon you alexander replied yes it must then be continued the king for the sake of the innocent beasts which live in your country for upon such men no sun should shine and no rain should fall end of the african verdict by johann gottfried herder seventeen forty four to eighteen hundred and three At the end of the road by Harl Oren Cummings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Liverpool. At the end of the road from Welsh Rarebet Tales by Harl Oren Cummings. At first the road was smooth and level. There were no hills, and the man had many companions. They laughed with him and made merry and there was no thought of care. "'Tis a pleasant life,' murmured the man. But even as he said the words, he wondered half fearfully if it could last, if the country through which they passed would always be as pleasant. Gradually the way became harder. Quite often the man was compelled to pause for breath, for there were difficult places to get over. And when he turned for assistance to the companions who had laughed and jested with him but a little while before, he found that they had passed just before calling distance at least they seemed not to hear him for they did not stop but the way was not all hilly and when he came to the smoother places the man hurried on faster than before and catching up with his companions was welcomed by them and they all made merry once more the smoother places became rarer however and the man found himself alone many times so one day he was joined by a new companion he will be like the others said the man bitterly he will not stay with me 
but the other heard him do not fear he answered i will stay with you to the journey's end i will never leave you nevertheless the man did not like his new companion he was not like the others he never jested and made merry and after that first time he did not speak again he was gaunt and thin and was clothed in rags but he stayed with the man when the others ran on ahead or lagged behind one day when the man was weary for there was no longer any one to cheer him and the way had become very hard he plucked up courage to speak to his silent companion again tis true you do not leave me like the rest he said they all deserted me when they left the pleasant country but i do not know you yet if we must travel together we should get better acquainted mine is not a pleasant name and few care to know me better than necessity compels answered the silent one but had you waited a little longer you would not have needed to ask i am known by many names but those who know me best call me poverty the man picked himself up from where he had thrown himself to rest and hurried on trying to leave his companion behind but the one in rags followed close and when the man stumbled and fell exhausted by his exertions the other was just at his heels and about this time the man noticed that the third wayfarer had joined them he could not see the newcomer's face however for he always kept a little way behind and there seemed to be a kind of shroud-like hood over his head there were no longer any easy stretches in the road and the man moved slowly many times he stumbled and fell and each time it was longer before he rose again he wondered but dared not ask the name of the new arrival who had moved nearer and was now but a few steps behind at last the man came to a part of the way more difficult than any before and he lay down for a few minutes to rest after a time he tried to go on but could not he was too weak and his companions seemed to be conspiring to hold him back he summoned all his strength and made one last effort to go on at first he seemed to advance a little but the hand of the ragged one thrust him back he stumbled fell rose again and staggered on a few steps then fell once more and could not rise this is the end he heard the silent one saying and i have kept my word i am still with you there was a sound of footsteps approaching stealthily and the man opened his eyes with an effort the companion who had always lagged behind was advancing swiftly and the black hood was drawn away from his face painfully the man raised himself on his elbow and looked at the figure for a second then fell back how strange that i did not know you before he muttered faintly for he had seen the other's face and recognized that it was death End of At the End of the Road by Harl Horan Cummings Cooklin, The Hound of Ulster by Eleanor Hull This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Cooklin, the Hound of Ulster by Eleanor Hull. Chapter 1 How Connor became King of Ulster. There was a great war between Connacht and Ulster, that is, between Connor, King of Ulster, and Maeve, the proud and mighty Queen of Connacht. This was the cause of the war between them. When Connor was but a lad, his mother was a widow, and there was no thought that Connor would be king, for the King of Ulster at that time was Fergus MacRoy, a powerful and noble king, whom his people loved, and though Connor was of high rank and dignity he stood not near the throne but his mother ness was ambitious for him and she used all her arts to bring it about that he should be called to the throne of ulster ness was a handsome woman and a woman of spirit and in her youth she had been a warrior and fergus admired her and she wrought upon him so that in the end he asked her to be his wife she made it a condition that for one year fergus would leave the sovereignty and that connor should take his place for said she i should like to have it said that my son had been a king and that his children should be called the descendants of a king fergus and the people of ulster liked not her request but she was firm and fergus all the more desired to marry her because he found it not easy to get her so at the last he gave way to her and he resigned the kingdom for one year into the hands of connor but as soon as connor was king ness set about to win away the hearts of the people of ulster from fergus and to transfer them in their allegiance to connor she supplied her son with wealth which he distributed secretly among the people 
buying them over to his side and she taught him how to act so that he won over the nobles and the great men of the province and when the year being out fergus demanded back the sovereignty he found that the league formed against him was so strong that he could do nothing the chief said that they liked connor well and that he was their friend and they were not disposed to part with him they said too that fergus having abandoned the kingdom for a year only to gain a wife cared little for it and had in fact resigned it and they agreed that fergus should keep his wife if he wished but that the kingdom should pass to connor and fergus was so wrath at this that he forsook his wife and went with a great host of his own followers into connacht to take refuge with queen meave and with alil her spouse but he swore to be revenged upon connor and he waited only an opportunity to incite meave to gather her army together that he might try to win back the sovereignty or at least to revenge the insult put upon him by connor and by ness now fergus macroy was of great stature a mighty man and a famous warrior and his strength was that of a hundred heroes and all men spoke of the sword of fergus which was so great and long that men said that it stretched like a rainbow or like a weaver's beam and that the head of his hosts was cormac the champion of the white carn of watching a son of connor who liked not the deed of his father for he was young and he had been one of the bodyguard of fergus and went with fergus into exile to connacht and that was called the black exile of fergus macroy end of chapter one how connor became king of ulster by eleanor hull farewell by guy de maupassant eighteen fifty to eighteen ninety three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by peter tomlinson the two friends were getting near the end of their dinner through the cafe windows they could see the boulevard crowded with people they could feel the gentle breezes which are wafted over paris on warm summer evenings and make you feel like going out somewhere you care not where under the trees and make you dream of moonlight rivers of fireflies and of larks one of the two henry seymour heaved a deep sigh and said ah i am growing old it's sad formerly on evenings like this i felt full of life now i only feel regrets life is short he was perhaps forty-five years old very bald and already growing stout the other pierre carnier a trifle older but thin and lively answered well my boy i have grown old without noticing it in the least i've always been merry healthy vigorous and all the rest as one sees oneself in the mirror every day one does not realize the work of age for it is slow regular and it modifies the countenance so gently that the changes are unnoticeable it is for this reason alone that we do not die of sorrow after two or three years of excitement for we cannot understand the alterations which time produces in order to appreciate them one would have to remain six months without seeing one's own face then oh what a shock and the women my friend how i pity the poor beings all their joy all their power all their life lies in their beauty which lasts ten years as i said i age without noticing it i thought myself practically a youth when i was almost fifty years old not feeling the slightest infirmity i went about happy and peaceful the revelation of my decline came to me in a simple and terrible manner which overwhelmed me for almost six months then i became resigned like all men i've often been in love but most especially once i met her at the seashore at etriat about twelve years ago shortly after the war 
There is nothing prettier than this beach during the morning bathing hour. It is small, shaped like a horseshoe, framed by high white cliffs, which are pierced by strange holes called the port, one stretching out into the ocean like the leg of a giant, the other short and dumpy. The women gather on the narrow strip of sand in this frame of high rocks, which they make into a gorgeous garden of beautiful gowns. The sun beats down on the shores, on the multicoloured parasols, on the blue-green sea, and all is gay, delightful, smiling. You sit down at the edge of the water, and you watch the bathers. The women come down, wrapped in long bathrobes, which they throw off daintily when they reach the foamy edge of the rippling waves, and they run into the water with a rapid little step, stopping from time to time for a delightful little thrill from the cold water, a short gasp. Very few stand the test of the bath. It is there that they can be judged, from the ankle to the throat. Especially on leaving the water are the defects revealed, although water is a powerful aid to flabby skin. The first time that I saw this young woman in the water, I was delighted, entranced. She stood the test well. There are faces whose charms appeal to you at first glance and delight you instantly. You seem to have found the woman whom you were born to love. I had that feeling and that shock. I was introduced and was soon smitten worse than I had ever been before. My heart longed for her. It is a terrible yet delightful thing thus to be dominated by a young woman. It is almost torture and yet infinite delight. Her look, her smile, her hair fluttering in the wind, the little lines of her face, the slightest movement of her features, delighted me, upset me, entranced me. She had captured me, body and soul, by her gestures, her manners, even by her clothes, which seemed to take on a peculiar charm as soon as she wore them. I grew tender at the sight of her veil, on some piece of furniture, her gloves thrown on a chair. Her gown seemed to me inimitable. Nobody has hats like hers. She was married, but her husband came only on Saturday and left on Monday. I didn't concern myself about him, anyhow. I wasn't jealous of him. I don't know why. Never did a creature seem to me to be of less importance in life to attract my attention less than this man. But she, how I loved her, how beautiful, graceful and young she was. She was youth, elegance, freshness itself. Never before had I felt so strongly what a pretty, distinguished, delicate, charming, graceful being woman is. Never before had I appreciated the seductive beauty to be found in the curve of a cheek, the movement of a lip, the pinkness of an ear, the shape of that foolish organ called the nose. This lasted three months. Then I left for America, overwhelmed with sadness. But her memory remained in me, persistent, triumphant. From far away I was as much hers as I had been when she was near me. Years passed by, and I did not forget her. The charming image of her person was ever before my eyes and in my heart, and my love remained true to her, a quiet tenderness now, something like the beloved memory of the most beautiful and the most enchanting thing I had ever met in my life. Twelve years are not much in a lifetime. One does not feel them slip by. The years follow each other gently and quickly, slowly yet rapidly each one is long and yet so soon over they add up so rapidly they leave so few traces behind them they disappear so completely that when one turns round to look back over bygone years one sees nothing and yet one does not understand how one happens to be so old it seemed to me really 
that hardly a few months separated me from that charming season on the sands of Etretat. Last spring I went to dine with some friends in Maison Lafitte. Just as the train was leaving, a big fat lady, escorted by four little girls, got into my car. I hardly looked at this mother hen, very big, very round, with a face as full as the moon, framed in an enormous be-ribboned hat. She was puffing, out of breath from having been forced to walk quickly. The children began to chatter. I unfolded my paper and began to read. We had just passed as near as when my neighbour suddenly turned to me and said, Excuse me, sir, but are you not Monsieur Garnier? Yes, madam. Then she began to laugh, the pleased laugh of a good woman, and yet it was sad. You do not seem to recognise me. I hesitated. It seemed to me that I had seen that face somewhere, but where, when? I answered, Yes and no. I certainly know you, and yet I cannot recall your name. She blushed a little. Madame Julie Lefebvre. Never had I received such a shock. In a second it seemed to me as though it were all over with me. I felt that a veil had been torn from my eyes, and that I was going to make a horrible and heart-rending discovery. So that was she, that big, fat, common woman, she. She became the mother of these four girls since I had last seen her. And these little beings surprised me as much as their mother. They were part of her. They were big girls and already had a place in life. Whereas she no longer counted. She, that marvel of dainty and charming gracefulness. It seemed to me that I had seen her but yesterday, and this is how I found her again. Was it possible? A poignant grief seized my heart, and also a revolt against nature herself, an unreasoning indignation against this brutal, nefarious act of destruction. I looked at her bewildered. Then I took her hand in mine, and tears came to my eyes. I wept for her lost youth, for I did not know this fat lady. She was also excited and stammered. I am greatly changed, am I not? What can you expect? Everything has its time. You see, I have become a mother, nothing but a good mother. Farewell to the rest, that is over. Oh, I never expected you to recognise me if we met. You too have changed. It took me quite a while to be sure that I was not mistaken. Your hair is all white. Just think, twelve years ago. Twelve years. My oldest girl is already ten. I looked at the child, and I recognised in her something of her mother's old charm, but something as yet unformed, something which promised for the future. And life seemed to me as swift as a passing train. We had reached Maison Lafitte. I kissed my old friend's hand. I had found nothing to utter but the most commonplace remarks. I was too much upset to talk. At night, alone, at home, I stood in front of the mirror for a long time, a very long time, and I finally remembered what I had been, finally saw in my mind's eye my brown moustache, my black hair and the youthful expression of my face. Now I was old. Farewell. End of Farewell by Guy de Maupassant Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Fillmore Elderberries by L. M. Montgomery 1874 to 1942. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. I expected as much, said Timothy Robinson. His tone brought the blood into Ellis Duncan's face. 
The lad opened his lips quickly, as if for an angry retort, but as quickly closed them again with a set firmness oddly like Timothy Robinson's own. When I heard that lazy, worthless father of yours was dead, I expected you and your mother would be looking to me for help. Timothy Robinson went on harshly, but you're mistaken if you think I'll give it. You've no claim on me, even if your father was my half-brother. No claim at all, and I'm not noted for charity. Timothy Robinson smiled grimly. It was very true that he was far from being noted for charity. His neighbours called him close and near. Some even went so far as to call him a miserly skinflint. But this was not true. It was, however, undeniable that Timothy Robinson kept a tight clutch on his purse strings, and although he sometimes gave liberally enough to any cause which really appealed to him, such causes were few and far between. I am not asking for charity, Uncle Timothy, said Ellis quietly. He passed over the slur at his father in silence, deeply as he felt it, for, alas, he knew that it was only too true. I expect to support my mother by hard and honest work, and I am not asking you for work on the ground of our relationship. I heard you wanted a hired man, and I have come to you, as I should have gone to any other man about whom I had heard it, to ask you to hire me. Yes, I do want a man, said Uncle Timothy dryly. A man, not a half-grown boy of fourteen, not worth his salt. I want somebody able and willing to work. Again Ellis flushed deeply and again he controlled himself. I am willing to work, Uncle Timothy, and I think you would find me able also if you would try me. I'd work for less than a man's wage at first, of course. You won't work for any sort of wages from me, interrupted Timothy Robinson decidedly. I tell you plenty that I won't hire you. You're the wrong man's son for that. Your father was lazy and incompetent and, worst of all, untrustworthy. I did try to help him once, and all I got was loss and ingratitude. I want none of his kind around my place. I don't believe in you, so you may as well take yourself off, Ellis. I've no more time to waste. Ellis took himself off, his ears tingling. As he walked homeward, his thoughts were very bitter. All Uncle Timothy had said about his father was true, and Ellis realised what account it was against him in his efforts to attain employment. Nobody wanted to be bothered with old Sam Duncan's son, though nobody had been so brutally outspoken as his uncle Timothy. Sam Duncan and Timothy Robinson had been half-brothers. Sam, the older, had been the son of Mrs. Robinson's former marriage. Never were two lads more dissimilar. Sam was a lazy, shiftless fellow, deserving all the hard things that came to be said of him. He would not work and nobody could depend on him, but he was a handsome lad with rather taking ways in his youth and at first people had liked him better than the close, blunt, industrious Timothy. Their mother had died in their childhood, but Mr. Robinson had been fond of Sam, and the boy had a good home. When he was twenty-two and Timothy eighteen, Mr. Robinson had died very suddenly, leaving no will. Everything he possessed went to Timothy. Sam immediately left. He said he would not stay there to be bossed by Timothy. He rented a little house in the village, married a girl, far too good for him, and started in to support himself and his wife by day's work. He had lounged, borrowed, and shirked through life. Once Timothy Robinson, perhaps moved by pity for Sam's wife and baby, had hired him for a year at better wages than most hired men received in Dalrymple. Sam idled through a month of it, then got offended and left in the middle of haying. Timothy Robinson washed his hands of him after that. When Ellis was fourteen, Sam Duncan died, after a lingering illness of a year. During this time the family were kept by the charity of pitying neighbours, for Ellis could not be spared from attendance on his father to make any attempt at earning money. 
Mrs. Duncan was a fragile little woman, worn out with her hard life, and not strong enough to wait on her husband alone. When Sam Duncan was dead and buried, Ellis straightened his shoulders and took counsel with himself. He must earn a livelihood for his mother and himself, and he must begin at once. He was tall and strong for his age, and had a fairly good education, his mother having determinedly kept him at school when he had pleaded to be allowed to go to work. He had always been a quiet fellow, and nobody in Dalrymple knew much about him. But they knew all about his father, and nobody would hire Ellis unless he were willing to work for a pittance that would barely clothe him. Ellis had not gone to his uncle Timothy until he had lost all hope of getting a place elsewhere. Now this hope too had gone. It was nearly the end of June and everybody who wanted help had secured it. Look where he would, Ellis could see no prospect of employment. If I could only get a chance, he thought miserably. I know I am not idle or lazy. I know I can work, if I could get a chance to prove it. He was sitting on the fence of the Fillmore Elderberry pasture, as he said it, having taken a short cut across the fields. This pasture was rather noted in Dalrymple. Originally a mellow and fertile field, it had been almost ruined by a persistent, luxuriant growth of elderberry bushes. Old Thomas Fillmore had at first tried to conquer them by mowing them down in the dark of the moon. But the elderberries did not seem to mind either moon or mowing, and flourished alike in all the quarters. For the past two years, old Thomas had given up the contest, and the elderberries had it all their own sweet way. Thomas Fillmore, a bent old man with a shrewd, nutcracker face, came through the bushes while Ellis was sitting on the fence. How do you, Ellis? Seen anything of my spotted calves? I've been looking for him for over an hour. No, I haven't seen any calves, but a good many might be in this pasture without being visible to the naked eye, said Ellis with a smile. Old Thomas shook his head ruefully. Them elders have been too many for me, he said. Did you ever see a worse-looking place? You'd hardly believe that twenty years ago there wasn't a better piece of land in Dalrymple than this lot, would ye? Such grass as grew here. The soil must be as good as ever if anything had a chance to grow on it, said Ellis. Couldn't those elders be rooted out? It'd be a back-breaking job, but I reckon it could be done if anyone had the muscle and patience and time to tackle it. I haven't the first at my age, and my hired man hasn't the last, and nobody would do it for what I could afford to pay. What will you give me if I undertake to clean the elders out of this field for you, Mr. Fillmore? asked Ellis quietly. Old Thomas looked at him with a surprised face which gradually reverted to its original shrewdness when he saw that Ellis was in earnest. "'You must be hard up for a job,' he said. "'I am,' was Ellis's laconic answer. "'Well, let me see.' Old Thomas calculated carefully. He never paid a cent more for anything than he could help, and was noted for hard bargaining. "'I'll give ye sixteen dollars if you clean out the whole field.' he said at length. Ellis looked at the pasture. He knew something about cleaning out elderberry brush, and he also knew that sixteen dollars would be very poor pay for it. Most of the elders were higher than a man's head, with big roots, thicker than his wrist, running deep into the ground. It's worth more, Mr. Fillmore, he said. Not to me, responded old Thomas dryly, I've plenty more land and I'm an old fellow without any sons. I ain't going to pay out money for the benefit of some stranger who'll come after me. You can take it or leave it at sixteen dollars. Ellis shrugged his shoulders. He had no prospect of anything else, and sixteen dollars were better than nothing. Very well, I'll take it, he said. Well, now, look here, said old Thomas shrewdly. I'll expect you to do the work thoroughly, young man. Them roots ain't to be cut off, remember, 
they'll have to be dug out, and I expect you to finish the job if you undertake it too, and not drop it halfway through if you get a chance for a better one. I'll finish with your elder bris before I leave them, promised Ellis. Ellis went to work the next day. His first move was to chop down all the brush and cart it into heaps for burning. This took two days and was comparatively easy work. The third day Ellis tackled the roots. By the end of the forenoon he had discovered just what cleaning out an elderberry pasture meant, but he set his teeth and resolutely persevered. During the afternoon Timothy Robinson, whose farmer joined the Fillmore place, wandered by and halted with a look of astonishment at the sight of Ellis, busily engaged in digging and tearing out huge, tough, stubborn elder roots. The boy did not see his uncle, but worked away with a vim and vigour that were not lost on the latter. He never got that muscle from Sam, reflected Timothy. Sam would have fainted at the mere thought of stumping elders. Perhaps I've been mistaken in the boy. Well, well, we'll see if he holds out. Ellis did hold out. The elderberries tried to hold out too, but they were no match for the lad's perseverance. It was a hard piece of work, however, and Ellis never forgot it. Week after week he toiled in the hot summer sun, digging, cutting, and dragging out roots. The job seemed endless, and his progress each day was discouragingly slow. He had expected to get through in a month, but he soon found it would take two. Frequently Timothy Robinson wandered by and looked at the increasing pile of roots and the slowly extending stretch of cleared land. But he never spoke to Ellis and made no comment on the matter to anybody. One evening, when the field was about half done, Ellis went home more than usually tired. It had been a very hot day. Every bone and muscle in him ached. He wondered dismally if he would ever get to the end of that wretched elderberry field. When he reached home, Jacob Green from Westdale was there. Jacob lost no time in announcing his errand. My hired boys broke his leg and I must fill his place right off. Somebody referred me to you. Guess I'll try you. Twelve dollars a month, board and lodging. What say? For a moment Ellis's face flushed with delight. Twelve dollars a month and permanent employment. Then he remembered his promise to Mr. Fulmore. For a moment he struggled with the temptation. Then he mastered it. Perhaps the discipline of his many encounters with those elderberry roots helped him to do so. "'I'm sorry, Mr. Green,' he said reluctantly. "'I'd like to go, but I can't. "'I promised Mr. Fillmore that I'd finish cleaning up his elderberry pasture "'when I'd once begun it, and I shan't be through for a month yet. "'Well, I'd see myself turning down a good offer for old Tom Fillmore,' said Jacob Green. "'It isn't for Mr. Fillmore, it's for myself,' said Ellis steadily. I promise, and I must keep my word. Jacob drove away grumblingly. On the road he met Timothy Robinson and stopped to relate his grievances. It must be admitted that there were times during the next month when Ellis was tempted to repent, having refused Jacob Green's offer. By the end of the month the work was done, and the Fillmore Elderbury pasture was an Elderbury pasture no longer. All that remained of the elders, root and branch, was piled in a huge heap ready for burning. And I'll come up and set fire to it when it's dry enough, Ellis told Mr. Fillmore. I claim the satisfaction of that. You've done the job thoroughly, said old Thomas. There's your sixteen dollars, and every cent of it was earned, if ever money was. I'll say that much for you. There ain't a lazy bone in your body. If you ever want a recommendation, just you come to me. As Ellis passed Timothy Robinson's place on the way home, that worthy himself appeared, strolling down his lane. Ah, Ellis, he said, speaking to his nephew for the first time since their interview two months before. So you've finished with your job? Yes, sir. Got your sixteen dollars, I suppose? 
It was worth four times that. Old Tom cheated you. You were foolish not to have gone to Green when you had the chance. I'd promised Mr. Fillmore to finish with his pasture, sir. Oh, <laughs> well, what are you going to do now? I don't know. Harvest will be on next week. I may get in somewhere as an extra hand for a spell. Ellis, said his uncle abruptly, after a moment's silence, I'm going to discharge my man. He's no earthly good. Will you take his place? I'll give you fifteen dollars a month and found. Ellis stared at Timothy Robinson. I thought you told me you had no place for my father's son, he said slowly. I've changed my mind. I've seen how you went at that elderberry job. Great snakes, there couldn't be a better test for anybody than rooting out them things. I know you can work. When Jacob Green told me why you'd refused his offer, I knew you could be depended on. You come to me and I'll do well by you. I have no kith or kin of my own except you. And look here, Ellis, I'm tired of hired housekeepers. Will your mother come up and live with us and look after things a bit? I've a good girl and she won't have to work hard. But there must be somebody at the head of a household. She must have a good headpiece, for you have inherited good qualities from someone, and goodness knows it wasn't from your father. Uncle Timothy, said Ellis respectfully but firmly, I'll accept your offer gratefully, and I'm sure Mother will too. But there is one thing I must say. Perhaps my father deserved all you say of him, but he is dead, and if I come to you it must be with the understanding that nothing more is ever to be said against him. Timothy Robinson smiled, a queer, twisted smile that yet had a hint of affection and comprehension in it. Very well, he said. I'll never cast his shortcomings up to you again. Come to me, and if I find you always as industrious and reliable as you've proved yourself to be negotiating them elders, I'll most likely forget that you ain't my own son some of these days. End of the Fillmore Elderberries by L. M. Montgomery Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Genius by Theodore Dreiser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. The Genius by Theodore Dreiser. Book One, Chapter Three. Eugene grew more and more moody and rather restless under Stella's increasing independence. She grew steadily more indifferent because of his moods. The fact that other boys were crazy for her consideration was a great factor. The fact that one particular boy, Harvey Rutter, was persistently genial, not insistent, really better looking than Eugene, and much better tempered, helped a great deal. Eugene saw her with him now and then, saw her go skating with him, or at least with a crowd of which he was a member. Eugene hated him heartily. He hated her at times for not yielding to him wholly, but he was none the less wild over her beauty. It stamped his brain with a type or ideal. Thereafter he knew, in a really definite way, what womanhood ought to be, to be really beautiful. Another thing it did was to bring home to him a sense of his position in the world. So far he had always been dependent on his parents for food, clothes and spending money, and his parents were not very liberal. He knew other boys who had money to run up to Chicago or down to Springfield. The latter was nearer, to have a Saturday and Sunday lark. No such gaieties were for him. His father would not allow it, or rather would not pay for it. There were other boys who, in consequence of amply provided spending money, were in the town dandies. He saw them kicking their heels outside the corner bookstore, the principal loafing place of the elite, on Wednesdays and Saturdays and sometimes on Sunday evenings, preparatory to going somewhere dressed in a luxury of clothing which was beyond his wildest dreams ted martinwood the son of the principal dry goods man had a frock coat in which he sometimes appeared when he came down to the barber shop for a shave before he went to call on his girl george anderson was possessed of a dress suit and wore dancing pumps at all dances there was ed waterbury who was known to have a horse and runabout of his own these youths were slightly older 
and were interested in girls of a slightly older set, but the point was the same. These things hurt him. He himself had no avenue of progress which, so far as he could see, was going to bring him to any financial prosperity. His father was never going to be rich. Anybody could see that. He himself had no practical progress in schoolwork. He knew that. He hated insurance, soliciting or writing. Despised the sewing machine business and did not know where he would get with anything which he might like to do in literature or art. His drawing seemed a joke. His writing or wish for writing pointless. He was broodingly unhappy. One day Williams, who had been watching him for a long time, stopped at his desk. I say, Whitla, why don't you go to Chicago? He said. There's a lot more up there for a boy like you than down here. You'll never get anywhere working on a country newspaper. I know it, said Eugene. Now, with me, it's different, went on Williams. I've had my rounds. I've got a wife and three children, and when a man's got a family, he can't afford to take chances. But you're young yet. Why don't you go to Chicago and get a paper? You could get something. What could I get? asked Eugene. Well, you might get a job as typesetter if you'd join the union. I don't know how good you'd be as a reporter. I hardly think that's your line. But you might study art and learn to draw. Newspaper artists make good money. Eugene thought of his art. It wasn't much. He didn't do much with it. Still, he thought of Chicago. The world appealed to him. If he could only get out of here, if he could only make more than seven or eight dollars a week, he brooded about this. One Sunday afternoon, he and Stella went with Myrtle to Sylvia's home. And after a brief stay, Stella announced that she would have to be going. Her mother would be expecting her back. Myrtle was for going with her, but altered her mind when Sylvia asked her to stay to tea. Let Eugene take her home, Sylvia said. Eugene was delighted in his persistent, hopeless way. He was not yet convinced that she could not be one to love. When they talked out in the fresh, sweet air, it was nearing spring. He felt that now he should have a chance of saying something which would be winning, which would lure her to him. They went out on a street next to the one she lived on quite to the confines of the town. She wanted to turn off at her street, but he had urged her not to. Do you have to go home just yet? he asked pleadingly. No, I can walk a little way, she replied. They reached a vacant place, the last house a little distance, back, talking idly. It was getting hard to make talk. In his efforts to be entertaining, he picked up three twigs to show her how a certain trick in balancing was performed. It consisted in laying two at right angles with each other, and with a third, using the latter as an upright. She could not do it, of course. She was not really very much interested. He wanted her to try, and when she did, took hold of her right hand to steady her efforts. No, don't, she said, drawing her hand away. I can do it. She stifled with the twigs unsuccessfully, and was about to let them fall, when he took hold of both her hands. It was so sudden that she could not free herself, and so she looked him straight in the eye. Let go, Eugene, please let go. He shook his head, gazing at her. Please let go, she went on. You mustn't do this. I don't want you to. Why? Because. Because why? Well, because I don't. Don't you like me any more, Stella, really? he asked. I don't think I do, not that way. But you did. I thought I did. Have you changed your mind? Yes, I think I have. He dropped her hands and looked at her fixedly and dramatically. The attitude did not appeal to her. They strolled back to the street, and when they neared her door, he said, Well, I suppose there's no use in my coming to see you any more. I think you'd better not, she said simply. She walked in, never looking back, and instead of going back to his sister's, he went home. He was in a very gloomy mood, and after sitting around for a while, went to his room. The night fell, and he sat there looking out at the trees and grieving about what he had lost. Perhaps he was not good enough for her. He could not make her love him. Was it that he was not handsome enough? He did not really consider himself good-looking. Or what was it, a lack of courage or strength? After a time he noticed that the moon was hanging over the trees, like a bright shield in the sky. Two layers of thin clouds were moving in different directions on different levels. He stopped in his cogitations to think where these clouds came from. On sunny days, when there were great argosies of them, he had seen them disappear before his eyes, and then, marvel of marvels, reappear out of nothingness. The first time he ever saw this, it astonished him greatly, for he had never known up to them what clouds were. Afterward, he read about them in his physical geography. Tonight, he thought of that, and of the great plains over which these winds swept, and of the grass and trees, great forests of them, miles and miles. What a wonderful world! Poets wrote about these things, Longfellow and Byron and Tennyson. He thought of Thanatopsis and of the Elegy. 
both of which he admired greatly. What was this thing, life? Then he came back to Stella with an ache. She was actually gone, and she was so beautiful. She would never really talk to him any more. He would never get to hold her hand or kiss her. He clenched his hands with the hurt. Oh, that night on the ice, that night in the sleigh, how wonderful they were. Finally he undressed and went to bed. He wanted to be alone, to be lonely. On his clean white pillow he lay and dreamed of the things that might have been. Kisses, caresses, a thousand joys. On Sunday afternoon he was lying in his hammock, thinking, thinking of what a dreary place Alexandria was. Anyhow, when he opened a Chicago Saturday afternoon paper, which was something like a Sunday one because it had no Sunday edition, and went gloomily through it, it was, as he had always found, full of a subtle wonder, the wonder of the city which drew him like a magnet. Here was the drawing of a big hotel someone was going to build. There was a sketch of a great pianist who was coming to play, an account of a new comedy drama of a little romantic section of Goose Island in the Chicago River, with its old decayed boats turned into houses and geese waddling about, an item of a man falling through a coal hole on South Halstead Street fascinated him. This last was at sixty two hundred and something, and the idea of such a long street seized on his imagination. What a tremendous city Chicago must be! The thought of car lines, crowds, trains came to him with almost a yearning appeal. All at once the magnet got him. It gripped his very soul, this wonder, this beauty, this life. I'm going to Chicago, he thought, and got up. There was his nice, quiet little home laid out before him. Inside were his mother, his father, Myrtle. Still, he was going. He could come back. Sure I can come back, he thought. Propelled by this magnetic power, he went in and upstairs to his room, and got a little grip of portmanteau he had. He put in it the things he thought he would immediately need. In his pocket were nine dollars, money he had been saving for some time. Finally he came downstairs and stood in the door of the sitting room. What's the matter? asked his mother, looking at his solemn introspective face. I'm going to Chicago, he said. When? she asked, astonished a little uncertain of just what he meant. Today, he said. No, you're joking. She smiled unbelievingly. This was a boyish prank. I'm going today, he said. I'm going to catch that four o'clock train. Her face saddened. You're not, she said. I can come back, he replied, if I want to. I want to get something else to do. His father came in at this time. He had a little workroom out in the barn where he sometimes cleaned machines and repaired vehicles. He was fresh from such a task now. What's up, he asked seeing his wife close to her boy. Eugene's going to Chicago. Since when, he inquired amusedly. Today. He says he's going right now. You don't mean it, said Whitla, astonished. He really did not believe it. Why don't you take a little time and think it over? What are you going to live on? I'll live, said Eugene. I'm going. I've had enough of this place. I'm going to get out. All right, said his father, who, after all, believed in initiative. Evidently, after all, he hadn't quite understood this boy. Got your trunk packed? No, but mother can send me that. Don't go today, pleaded his mother. Wait until you get something ready, Eugene. Wait and do a little thinking about it. Wait until tomorrow. I want to go today, ma. He slipped his arm around her. Little ma. He was bigger than she by now, and still growing. All right, Eugene, she said softly, but I wish you wouldn't. Her boy was leaving her. Her heart was hurt. I can come back, ma. It's only a hundred miles. Well, all right, she said finally, trying to brighten. I'll pack your bag. I have already. She went to look. Well, it'll soon be time, said Whitla, who was thinking that Eugene might back down. I'm sorry. Still, it may be a good thing for you. You're always welcome here, you know. I know, said Eugene. They went finally to the train together, he and his father a myrtle. His mother couldn't. She stayed to cry. On the way to the depot, they stopped at Sylvia's. Why, Eugene, she exclaimed. How ridiculous. Don't go. He's set, said Whitla. Eugene finally got loose. He seemed to be fighting love home ties, everything, every step of the way. Finally, he reached the depot. The train came. Whitla grabbed his hand affectionately. Be a good boy, he said, swallowing a gulp. Myrtle kissed him. You're so funny, Eugene. Write me. I will. He stepped on the train. The bell rang. Out the cars rolled. Out and on. He looked out on the familiar scenes, and then a real ache came to him. Stella, his mother, his father, Myrtle, the little home. They were all going out of his life. Hmm. He half groaned, clearing his throat. Gee! And then he sank back and tried, as usual, not to think. He must succeed. That's what the world was made for. That was what he was made for. That was what he would have to do. End of Book One, Chapter Three by Theodore.
Dreiser. Gilray's Flower Pot by J. M. Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. I charge Gilray's unreasonableness to his ignoble passion for cigarettes, and the story of his flower pot has, therefore, an obvious moral. The want of dignity he displayed about that flower pot on his return to London would have made anyone sorry for him. I had my own work to look after, and really could not be tending his chrysanthemum all day. After he came back, however, there was no reasoning with him, and I admit that I never did water his plant, though always intending to do so. The great mistake was in not leaving the flower pot in charge of William John. No doubt I readily promised to attend to it, but Gilray deceived me by speaking as if the watering of a plant was the merest pastime. He had to leave London for a short provincial tour, and, as I see now, took advantage of my good nature. As Gilroy had owned his flower pot for several months, during which time, I take him at his word, he had watered it daily, he must have known he was misleading me. He said that you got into the way of watering a flower pot regularly, just as you wind up your watch. That certainly is not the case. I always wind up my watch, and I never watered the flower pot. Of course, if I had been living in Gilray's rooms with the thing always before my eyes, I might have done so. I proposed to take it into my chambers at the time, but he would not hear of that. Why? How Gilray came by this chrysanthemum I do not inquire, but whether, in the circumstances, he should not have made a clean breast of it to me is another matter. Undoubtedly, it was an unusual thing to put a man to the trouble of watering a chrysanthemum daily without giving him its history. My own belief has always been that he got it in exchange for a pair of boots and his old dressing gown. He hints that it was a present, but as one who knows him well, I may say that he is the last person a lady would be likely to give a chrysanthemum to. Besides, if he was so proud of the plant, he should have stayed at home and watered it himself. He says that I never meant to water it, which is not only a mistake, but unkind. My plan was to run downstairs immediately after dinner every evening and give it a thorough watering. One thing or another, however, came in the way. I often remembered about the chrysanthemum when I was in the office, but even Gilray could hardly have expected me to ask leave of absence merely to run home and water his plant. You must draw the line somewhere, even in a government office. When I reached home, I was tired, inclined to take things easily, and not at all in a proper condition for watering flower pots. Then Arcadians would drop in. I put it to any sensible man or woman. Could I have been expected to give up my friends for the sake of a chrysanthemum? Again, it was my custom of an evening, if not disturbed, to retire with my pipe into my cane chair, and there pass the hours communing with great minds, or, when the mood was on me, trifling with a novel. Often, when I was in the middle of a chapter, Gilray's flower pot stood up before my eyes crying for water. He does not believe this, but it is the solemn truth. At those moments it was touch and go whether I watered his chrysanthemum or not. Where I lost myself was in not hurrying to his rooms at once with a tumbler. I said to myself that I would go when I had finished my pipe, but by that time the flower pot has escaped my memory. This may have been weakness. All I know is that I should have saved myself much annoyance if I had risen and watered the chrysanthemum there and then. But... Would it not have been rather hard on me to have had to forsake my books for the sake of Gilray's flowers and flower pots and plants and things? What right has a man to go and make a garden of his chambers? All the three weeks he was away, Gilray kept pestering me with letters about his chrysanthemum. He seemed to have no faith in me, a detestable thing in a man who calls himself your friend. I had promised to water his flower pot, and between friends a promise is surely sufficient. It is not so, however, when Gilray is one of them. I soon hated the sight of my name in his handwriting. It was not as if he said outright that he wrote entirely to know whether I was watering his plant. His references to it were introduced with all the appearance of afterthoughts. Often they took the form of postscripts. By the way, are you watering my chrysanthemum? Or, the chrysanthemum ought to be a beauty by this time. Or, you must be quite an adept now at watering plants. Gilray declares now that in answer to one of these ingenious epistles, I wrote to him saying, I had just been watering his chrysanthemum. 
My belief is that I did no such thing. Or if I did, I meant to water it as soon as I'd finished my letter. He has never been able to bring this home to me, he says, because he burned my correspondence. As if a businessman would destroy such a letter. It was yet more annoying when Gilray took to postcards. To hear the postman's knock, and then discover, when you are expecting an important communication, that it is only a postcard about a flower pot, that is really too bad. And then I consider that some of the postcards bordered upon insult. One of them said, What about chrysanthemum? Reply at once. This was just like Gilray's overbearing way, but I answered politely, and so far as I know, truthfully, chrysanthemum all right. Knowing that there was no explaining things to Gilray, I redoubled my exertions to water his flower pot as the day for his return drew near. Once, indeed, when I rang for water, I could not for the life of me remember what I wanted it for when it was brought. Had I had any forethought, I should have left the tumbler stand just as it was to show Gilray on his return. But unfortunately, William John had misunderstood what I wanted the water for and put a decanter down beside it. Another time I was actually on the stair rushing to Gilray's door when I met the housekeeper and stopping to talk to her lost my opportunity again. To show how honestly anxious I was to fulfill my promise, I need only add that I was several times awakened in the watches of the night by a haunting consciousness that I had forgotten to water Gilray's flower pot. On these occasions I spared no trouble to remember again in the morning. I reached out of bed to a chair and turned it upside down, so that the sight of it when I rose might remind me that I had something to do. With the same object I crossed the tongs and poker on the floor. Gilray maintains that instead of playing fool's tricks like these, fool's tricks, I should have got up and gone at once to his rooms with my water bottle. What? And disturbed my neighbors? Besides, could I reasonably be expected to risk catching my death of cold for the sake of a wretched chrysanthemum? One reads of men doing such things for young ladies who seek lilies in dangerous ponds, or edelweiss on overhanging cliffs. But Gilray was not my sweetheart nor, I feel certain, any other person's. I come now to the day prior to Gilray's return. I had just reached the office when I remembered about the chrysanthemum. It was my last chance. If I watered it once, I should be in a position to state that, whatever condition it might be in, I had certainly been watering it. I jumped into a hansom, told the cabby to drive to the inn, and twenty minutes afterwards had one hand on Gilray's door, while the other held the largest water can in the house. Opening the door, I rushed in. The can nearly fell from my hand. There was no flower pot. I rang the bell. Mr. Gilray's chrysanthemum, I cried. What do you think William John said? He coolly told me that the plant was dead and had been flung out days ago. I went to the theater that night to keep myself from thinking. All next day, I contrived to remain out of Gilray's sight. When we met, he was stiff and polite. He did not say a word about the chrysanthemum for a week and then it all came out with a rush. I let him talk. With servants flinging out the flower pots faster than I could water them, what more could I have done? A coolness between us was inevitable. This I regretted, but my mind was made up on one point. I would never do Gilray a favor again. End of Gilray's Flower Pot by J. M. Barry. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Goat Herd from Scandinavian and North German Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Goat Herd. Footnote The story which suggested to Washington Irving the legend of Happy Hollow. Rip Van Winkle. End footnote. Peter Klaus, a goat herd from Sittendorf, who led his herd to pasture on the Kaifhauser, was accustomed in the evening to stop and let them rest in a place enclosed by old walls, and there to count them. He had observed for several days that one of his finest goats, as soon as they came to this place, disappeared and did not follow the herd till quite late. He watched it more closely, and saw that it crept through a rent in the wall. 
he followed and found it in a cave comfortably enjoying some oats which were falling from the roof he looked up at seeing the rain of oats but with all his peering was unable to solve the mystery at length he heard the neighing and stamping of horses overhead from whose cribs the oats must have fallen while the goat herd was thus standing lost in astonishment at hearing the sound of horses in such an uninhabited mountain a young man suddenly appeared who silently beckoned peter to follow him the goat herd ascended some steps and came through a walled courtyard to a deep dell enclosed by steep craggy precipices down into which a dim light penetrated through the dense foliage of the overhanging branches here he found on a well-leveled cool grass plot twelve grave knightly personages playing at skittles not one of them uttering a word peter was silently directed to set up the fallen skittles he began his task with trembling knees when with a stolen glance he viewed the long beards and slashed doublets of the noble knights by degrees however use made him bolder he gazed around him with a more observing eye and at length ventured to drink from a can that stood near him the wine in which exhaled towards him a delicious fragrance he felt as if inspired with new life and as often as he was fatigued he drew fresh strength from the inexhaustible wine can but at length he was overpowered by sleep when he awoke he found himself again on the enclosed plain where his goats had been accustomed to rest he rubbed his eyes but could see neither dog nor goats he was astonished at the height of the grass and at the sight of shrubs and trees which he had never before observed shaking his head he walked on through all the ways and paths along which he had been in the daily habit of wandering with his herd but nowhere could he find a trace of his goats at his feet he saw sittendorf and with quickened steps began to descend the mountain for the purpose of inquiring in the village after his herd the people he met coming from the village were all strangers to him and differently clad and did not even speak like his acquaintances every one stared at him when he inquired after his goats and stroked their chins he unconsciously did the same and found to his astonishment that his beard was more than a foot long he began to think that both himself and all around were bewitched nevertheless he recognized the mountain he had just descended as the kaifhauser the houses also with their gardens were familiar to him some boys too when asked by a traveller the name of the place answered sittendorf he now walked up the village towards his own hut he found it in a very ruinous condition before it lay a strange herd boy in a ragged jacket and by him a half famished dog which showed its teeth and snarled when he called to it he passed through an opening where once had been a door when he entered he found all void and desolate like a drunken man he reeled out at the back door calling on wife and children by name but no one heard no voice answered soon many women and children collected round the old grey beard all eagerly asking him what he sought to ask before his own house after his wife and children or after himself appeared to him so extraordinary that in order to get rid of his questioners he named the first one that recurred to his memory kurt stephan all were now silent and looked at each other at length an aged woman said for more than twelve years he has dwelt under the sachsenberg but you will not get so far to-day where is welter meyer god be merciful to him answered an old crone leaning on her crutches for more than fifteen years he has lain in that house which he will never leave shuddering he now recognized a neighbor though as it seemed to him grown suddenly old but he had lost all desire to make further inquiries 
there now pressed forward through the inquisitive crowd a young comely woman with a boy in her arms about a year old and a little fellow of four years holding by her hand they were all three the image of his wife what is your name asked he with astonishment maria and your father's god be merciful to him peter claus it was now twenty years and more that we searched for him a whole day and night upon the kaifhauser the herd having come back without him i was then seven years old no longer could the goat herd dissemble i am peter claus he exclaimed and no other taking the boy out of his daughter's arms every one stood as if petrified until first one voice and then another exclaimed yes this is peter claus welcome neighbor welcome after twenty years end of the goat herd from scandinavian and north german tales his wedded wife by rudyard kipling this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by chad horner from liverpool his wedded wife from plain tales from the hills by rudyard kipling cry murder in the market-place and each will turn upon his neighbour anxious eyes that ask art thou the man we hunted cain some centuries ago across the world that bred the fear our own misdeeds maintain to-day vibert's moralities shakespeare says something about worms or it may be giants or beetles turning if you tread on them too severely the safest plan is never to tread on a worm not even on the last new subaltern from whom with his buttons hardly out of their tissue paper and the red of sappy english beef in his cheeks this is the story of the worm that turned for the sake of brevity we will call henry augustus ramsay bazan the worm although he really was an exceedingly pretty boy without a hair on his face and with a waist like a girl's when he came out to the second shikaris and was made unhappy in several ways the shikaris are a high caste regiment and you must be able to do things well play a banjo or ride more than a little or sing or act to get on with him the worm did nothing except fall off his pony and knock chips out of gateposts with his trap even that became monotonous after a time he objected to whist cut the cloth at billiards sang out of tune kept very much to himself and wrote to his mamma and sisters at home Four of these five things were vices, which the Shikaris objected to and set themselves to eradicate. Everyone knows how subalterns are, by brother subalterns, softened and not permitted to be ferocious. It is good and wholesome, and has no one any harm unless tempers are lost, and then there is trouble. There was a man once, but that is another story. The Shikaris Shikard the worm very much and he bore everything without winking he was so good and so anxious to learn and flushed so pink that his education was cut short and he was left to his own devices by everyone except the senior subaltern who continued to make life a burden to the worm the senior subaltern meant no harm but his chaff was coarse and he didn't quite understand where to stop he had been waiting too long for his company and that always sours a man also he was in love which made him worse one day after he had borrowed the worm's trap for a lady who never existed had used it himself all the afternoon had sent a note to the worm purporting to come from the lady and was telling the mess all about it the worm rose in his place and said in his quiet ladylike voice that was a very pretty sale but I'll lay you a month's pay to a month's pay when you get your step, that I work a sale on you that you'll remember for the rest of your days, and the regiment after you when you're dead or broke. The worm wasn't angry in the least, and the rest of the mess shouted. 
Then the senior subaltern looked at the worm from the boots upwards and down again and said, Dumb baby. The worm took the rest of the mess to witness that the bet had been taken and retired into a book with a sweet smile. Two months passed and the senior subaltern still educated the worm who began to move about a little more as the hot weather came on. I have said that the senior subaltern was in love. The curious thing is that a girl was in love with the senior subaltern. Though the colonel said awful things and the majors snorted and married captains looked unutterable wisdom and the junior scoffed, those two were engaged. The senior subaltern was so pleased with getting his company and his acceptance at the same at the same time that he forgot to bother the worm. The girl was a pretty girl and had money of her own. She does not come into the story at all. One night at the beginning of the hot weather, all the mess, except the worm, who had gone to his own room to write home letters, were sitting on the platform outside the mess house. The band had finished playing, but no one wanted to go in. And the captain's wives were there also. The folly of a man in love is unlimited. The senior subaltern had been holding forth on the merits of the girl he was engaged to, and the ladies were purring approval, while the men yawned. When there was a rustle of skirts in the dark, and a tired, faint voice lifted itself, Where's my husband? I do not wish in the least to reflect on the mortality of the, of the Sicaris, but it is on record that four men jumped up as if they had been shot. Three of them were married men. Perhaps they were afraid that their wives had come from home unbeknownst. The four said that he had acted on the impulse of the moment. He explained this afterwards. Then the voice cried, Oh, Lionel. Lionel was the senior, subaltern's name. A woman came into the little circle of light by the candles on the peg tables, stretching out her hands to the dark where the senior subaltern was and sobbing. We rose to our feet, feeling that things were going to happen and ready to believe the worst. In this bad, small world of ours, one knows so little of the life of the next man, which, after all, is entirely his own concern. That one is not surprised when a crash comes. Anything might turn up any day for any one. Perhaps the senior subaltern had been trapped in his youth. Men are crippled the, that way occasionally. We didn't know. We wanted to hear and the captain's wives were as anxious as we. If he had been trapped, he was to be excused, for the woman from nowhere in the dusty shoes and grey travelling dress were, was very lovely, with black hair and great eyes full of tears. She was tall, with a fine figure, and her voice had a running sob in it, painful, pitiful to hear. As, as soon as the senior subaltern stood up, she threw her arms round his neck and called him my darling, and said she could not bear waiting alone in England, and his letters were so short and cold that she was his to the end of the world, and would, and would he forgive her? This did not sound quite like a lady's way of speaking. It was too demonstrative. Things seemed black indeed, and the captain's wives peered under their eyebrows at the senior subaltern, and the colonel's face set light like the day of judgment framed in grey bristles, and no one spoke for a while. Next the colonel said very shortly, Well, sir, and the woman sobbed afresh. The senior subaltern was half choked with the arms round his neck, but he grasped out, It's a d d lie. I never had a wife in my life. Don't swear, said the colonel. Come into the mess. We must sift this clear somehow, and he sighed to himself, for he believed in his sicaris, did the colonel. We tripped into the ante-room under the full lights, and there we saw how beautiful the woman was. 
she stood up in the middle of us all, sometimes choking with crying, then hard and proud, and then holding out her arms to the senior subaltern. It was like the fourth act of a tragedy. She told us how the senior subaltern had married her when he was home and on leave eighteen months before, and she seemed to know all that we knew, and more too, of his people and his past life. He was white and ashy grey, trying now and again to break into the torrent of her words, and we, noting how lovely she was, and what a criminal he looked, esteemed him a beast of the worst kind. We felt sorry for him, though. I shall never forget the indictment of the senior subaltern by his wife, nor will he. It was so sudden, rushing out of the dark, unannounced, into our dull lives. The captain's wife stood back, but their eyes were alight, and you could see that they had already convicted and sentenced the senior subaltern. The colonel seemed five years older. One major was shading his eyes with his hand and watching the woman from underneath it. Another was chewing his moustache and smiling quietly as if he were witnessing a play. Full in the open space in the centre, by the west tables, the senior subaltern's ter terrier, something for fleas. I remember all this as clearly as though a photograph were in my hand. I remember the look of horror on the senior subaltern's face. It was rather like seeing a man hanged, but much more interesting. Finally, the woman wound up by saying that the senior subaltern carried a double F.M. in tattoo on his left shoulder. We all knew that, and to our innocent minds it seemed to clinch the matter. But one of the bachelor majors said very politely, I presume that your marriage certificate would be more to the purpose. That roused the woman. She stood up and sneered at the senior subaltern for a cur, and abused the major and the colonel and all the rest. Then she swept, then she wept, and then she pulled a paper from her breast, saying imperially, Take that, and let my husband, my lawfully wedded husband, read it aloud, if he dare. There was a hush, and the men looked into each other's eyes as the senior subaltern came forward, in a dazed and dizzy way, and took the paper. We were wondering, as we stared, whether there was anything against any one of us that might turn up later on. The senior subaltern's throat was dry, but as he ran his eye over the paper, he broke out into a hoarse cackle of relief, and said to the woman, you young black guard. But the woman had fled through a door, and on the paper was written, This is to certify that I, the worm, have paid in full my debts to the senior subaltern, and further that the senior subaltern is my debtor. By agreement on the 23rd of February, and by the mess attested, as by the mess attested, uh, to the extent of one month's captain's pay in the lawful currency of the Indian Empire. Then a deputation set off for the worm for the worm's quarters and found him betwixt and between, unlacing his stays with the hat, wig, serg, dress, etc. on the bed. He came over as he was, and the Sicaris shouted till the gunner's mess sent over to know if they might have a share of the fun. I think we were all, except the colonel and the senior subaltern, a little disappointed that the scandal had come to nothing. But that is human nature. There could be no two words about the worm's acting. It leaned as near to a nasty tragedy as anything this side of a joke can. When most of the subalterns sat upon him with suffocations to find out why he had not said that acting was his strong point, he answered very quietly, I don't think you ever asked me. I used to act at home with my sisters, but no acting with girls could account for the worm's display that night. Personally, I think it was a bad, it was in bad taste. 
beside, besides being dangerous, there is no sort of use in playing with fire, even for fun. Sicaris made him president of the Regimental Dramatic Club, and when the senior subaltern paid up his debt, which he did at once, the worm sank the money in scenery and dresses. He was a good worm, and the Sicaris were proud of him. The only, back, the only drawback is that he has been christened Mrs. Senior Subaltern, and as there are now two Mrs. Senior Subalterns in the station, this is sometimes confusing to strangers. Later on I will tell you of a case something like this, but with all the jest left out, and nothing in it but real trouble. End of His Wedded Wife by Rudyard Kepling Hunted by a Wild Stallion by J. E. Collins This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez Hunted by a Wild Stallion Towards the last of August, my cousin and myself, both of us lads of sixteen, had been plover shooting on the airy plains near Island Head on the Newfoundland coast. Having occasion to go from the Cape to a miner's camp near the head, we decided to proceed around the cliffs where the air was fresh and bracing in preference to the sod and tiresome marshes further inland. About three o'clock we set out, having a tramp of eight miles before us. Our course lay close to the edge of those sheer iron-bound cliffs that rise haughtily out of the sea to a height of from two hundred to five hundred feet. Not a bush was in sight, upland and hollow being covered with a short, thick growth of grass and succulent weeds. It was tiresome and sometimes perilous work to descend a couple of hundred feet into one of these gorges and scale the other side again. I have often, when a lad, inquired whence came the succession of these mighty hollows along this and other parts of my native coast. At first sight, you would not attribute the tremendous gouging out to the action of flood, for only a tiny brook a couple of feet wide and incapable of rounding its pebbles hurries along to fling its little thin silvery body over the precipice into the sea. But reflection has since taught me that they must be due to mighty torrents caused by the melting glacier that spared Newfoundland, then a part of the mainland, no more than any other portion of the continent. On the mountain tops we shot plover and curlew till our ammunition was exhausted, and the sun was only half an hour high. Then we quickened our pace, for the camp of the miners was still six miles distant. As we reached the top of the highest plateau, jaded from the exhausting climb, we heard the far-off but keen, vicious whinny of a horse. We spoke not, but looked at each other, for we were now aware of what we had forgotten before, that the wild stallion Black Glossy was grazing about those airy meadows. Further down the coast were other stallions let loose during the summer while the fishermen were away in their boats, but none was so much to be dreaded as this fierce brute whose name sent terror into the heart of every timid traveller we had no means of defence having fired away our ammunition but we were cool and promptly decided to get off level ground and trust to escape in some cliffside or slope where the beast could not get a footing so we were off with the speed of the wind about a third of a mile beyond us lay the edge of a slope that ran down to a small cave, and from a dim recollection which I had retained of the spot, I was in hopes if we could reach there before the stallion to make our escape. Again came the same wild neigh, and in the distance we could hear the dull thud of hoofs upon the hard, dry top of the upland. I glanced hastily around, and at a distance of about a third of a mile, saw our pursuer, he was as black as a raven, and the shining of his coat I could see even at that distance. His head curved downward, his body seemed to be gathered up and shortened, and his tail streamed out behind him. 
our terror almost lent wings to our feet. Nearer and wilder grew the whinny, but we scarce trusted ourselves to look back. We were nearing the slope, but I was not certain that the portion we were approaching was gradual enough to afford a foothold. I had breath enough to say to my cousin Ned, If he overtakes us, our only chance is to stop short, swerve aside, and then dart straight ahead again, which will cause him to curve round and lose time. It is his heels that we have most to guard against. We were at the slope and found that it was not so steep as we could have desired it. Below, a small brook brawled over the stones down the incline to be lulled and lost in the sand between high tide mark and the stretch of wild meadows at the foot of the hill. Nimbly we ran down, but fifteen paces above us, at the spot where we had begun the descent, was the stallion. He did not, as I supposed he would, rush headlong down, but snorted and pawed the sand with his forehoofs. Then, wheeling, he galloped in the direction of a faint path that led through a more level passage. We knew that he must reach the bottom of the valley almost as soon as we could, so we sprang, ran, and sometimes found ourselves rolling down the steep, grassy slope. The neighing of the infuriated brute was now more constant and more appallingly shrill, and the three walls of the hollow gave echoes of the vicious cry till it seemed to our terrified imagination as if we were being pursued by twenty demon horses. The sun, too, had just gone down, and in this lonely place walled by great mountains, with a weird marsh and a complaining surf before us, superstitious fear was added to the terror of pursuit. We reached the bottom safely, and observed running out into the cave a narrow ledge of rock. Upon that was all I had breath to say, hastily indicating the rock with my hand. Then we struck out across the marsh and the terrible brute was close by us, his tail in the air, nostrils distended, his eyes bloodshot. We stopped short and swerved to the left when he was so close that we might have felt his hot breath upon us, and as he curved round, almost losing his legs, we darted on. I shall never forget the thrill of that moment in watching the result of our maneuver. As he swept round, his tongue was out and he flung foam from his open jaws, his thin slippers, bright from running over the grass, gleamed almost in our faces as he wheeled round. Our ruse had saved us. Ere it was necessary to repeat the trick, we had both mounted the rock and were nimbly running out to its furthest point where the spray broke slightly over us. From this point we could leap upon a larger rock whence we might take a long range of strand to our right after the tide had ebbed another half hour. Now the danger and the terror over, we could not but enjoy the discomfiture of our baffled pursuer. A dozen times did he rush out to the surf, plash the water with his hoofs, and plough up the sand. Then he would go careering along the marsh's marge, with mane erect, uttering his shrill, fierce whinny, and filling every nook about the cliffs with terrifying echoes. We jumped upon the larger rock and stood there, awaiting the fall of the tide. The gloaming deepened, and still the maddened brute raved up and down the strand, plashed into the marsh, tearing up the lilies and the violet flag blooms with his infuriate feet, crying all the while like a balked fiend. And when it became totally dark, before the rising of the moon, we could see gleaming out of the deep dusk by the verge of the marsh two eyes that resembled kindled emeralds. Beyond the rock on which we stood, every now and again a fin or tail would break the surface of the water and scatter myriad little phosphorescent beads about like showers of silver spray. The splashing was probably made by sharks, for before the darkness came we could see them lurking around the rocks in the clear green waters and at intervals pushing a black fin above the surface. We had at the first thought of leaving our guns behind us on the rock and wading and swimming around the point to the strand, but the terror of a shark's crunching jaws was not more welcome than the shining heels or the vicious teeth of the stallion. 
when the moon rose above the sea, the tide was out and left a dark belt around the base of the rock. Once more our eyes searched for the foiled horse. He was beyond the marsh, standing in deep gloom under the shoulder of the precipice. The last thing I remembered noting as I slid from the rock upon the clammy shingle were two globes of smoldering fire looking toward our point of departure, and as we passed around the point that terrible neigh, it was the last time we heard it, again started a hundred echoes. About nine o'clock we reached the miner's camp, eating the more heartily and sleeping the more soundly for our afternoon of strain and terror. End of Hunted by a Wild Stallion by J. E. Collins In the Name of the Law by Stanley J. Wayman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Name of the Law On the moorland, above the old grey village of Carbet in Finisterre, Finisterre, the most westerly province of Brittany, stands a cottage, built, as all the cottages in that country are, of rough-hewn stones. It is a poor, rude place today, but it wore an aspect far more rude and primitive a hundred years ago say on an august day in the year seventeen ninety three when a man issued from the doorway and shading his eyes from the noonday sun gazed long and fixedly in the direction of a narrow rift which a few score paces away breaks the monotony of the upland level this man was tall and thin and unkempt his features expressing a mixture of cunning and simplicity. He gazed a while in silence, but at length uttered a grunt of satisfaction as the figure of a woman rose gradually into sight. She came on slowly, in a stooping posture, dragging behind her a great load of straw, which completely hid the little sledge on which it rested, and which was attached to her waist by a rope of twisted hay. The figure of a woman rather of a girl as she drew nearer it could be seen that her cheeks though brown and sunburned were as smooth as a child's she looked scarcely eighteen her head was bare and her short petticoats of some coarse stuff left visible bare feet thrust into wooden shoes she advanced with her head bent and her shoulders strained forward her face dull and patient once and once only, when the man's eyes left her for a moment, she shot him a look of scared apprehension. And later, when she came abreast of him, her breath coming and going with her exertions, he might have seen, had he looked closely, that her strong brown limbs were trembling under her. But the man noticed nothing in his impatience, and only chid her for her slowness, "'Where have you been dawdling, lazy bones? he cried. She murmured, without halting, that the sun was hot. "'Sun hot!' he retorted. "'Jeanne is lazy, I think. "'Mon Dieu, that I should have married a wife who was tired by noon. "'I had better left you to that never-do-well Pierre Buna. "'But I have news for you, my girl.' He lounged after her as he spoke, his low, cunning face, the face of the worst kind of French peasant, flickering with cruel pleasure, as he saw how she started at his words. She made no answer, however. Instead, she drew her load with increased vehemence towards one of the two doors which led into the building. "'Well, well, I will tell you presently,' he called after her. "'Be quick and come to dinner.' He entered himself by the other door, the house was divided into two chambers by a breast-high partition of wood. The one room served for kitchen, the other, now half full of straw, was barn and granary, fowl-house and dovecot in one. "'Be quick,' he called to her. Standing in the house-room, he could see her head as she stooped to unload the straw. In a moment she came in, her shoes clattering on the floor. 
the perspiration stood in great beads on her forehead and showed how little she had deserved his reproach she sat down silently avoiding his eyes but he thought nothing of this it was no new thing it pleased him if anything well my jeanne he said in his jibing tone are you longing for my news the hand she stretched out towards the pitcher of cider which with black bread and onions formed their meal shook but she answered simply if you please michel well the girondins have been beaten my girl and are flying all over the country that is the news master pierre is among them i do not doubt if he has not been killed already i wish he would come this way why she asked suddenly looking up at last a flash of light in her grey eyes why he repeated grinning across the table at her because he would be worth five crowns to me there is five crowns i am told on the head of every girondin who has been in arms my girl the french revolution it will be understood was at its height the more moderate and constitutional republicans the girondins as they were called worsted in paris by the jacobins and the mob had lately tried to raise the provinces against the capital and to this end had drawn together at caen near the border of brittany they had been defeated however and the jacobins in this month of august were preparing to take a fearful vengeance at once on them and the royalists the reign of terror had begun even to such a boor as this sitting over his black bread the revolution had come home and in common with many a thousand others he wondered what he could make of it the girl did not answer even by the look of contempt to which he had become accustomed and for which he hated her and he repeated five crowns ah it is money that is mon dieu then with a sudden exclamation he sprang up what is that he cried he had been sitting with his back to the barn but he turned now so as to face it something had startled him a rustling in the straw behind him what is that he said again his hand on the table his face lowering and watchful the girl had risen also and as the last word passed his lips sprang by him with a low cry and aimed a frantic blow with her stool at something he could not see what is it he asked recoiling a rat she answered breathless and she aimed another blow at it where he asked fretfully where is it he snatched his stool too and at that moment a rat darted out of the straw ran nimbly between his legs and plunged into a hole by the door he flung the wooden stool after it but of course in vain it was a rat he said as if before he had doubted it thank god she muttered she was shaking all over he stared at her in stupid wonder what did she mean what had come to her have you had a sunstroke my girl he said suspiciously her nut-brown face was a shade less brown than usual but she met his eyes boldly and said no adding an explanation which for the moment satisfied him but he did not sit down again when she went out he went out also and though as she retired slowly to the rye fields and work she repeatedly looked back at him it was always to find his eyes upon her when this had happened half a dozen times a thought struck him here now he muttered the rat ran out of the straw nevertheless he still stood gazing after her with a cunning look upon his features until she disappeared over the edge of the rift and then he crept back to the door of the barn and stole in out of the sunlight into the cool darkness of the raftered building across which a dozen rays of light were shooting laden with dancing motes inside he stood stock still until he had regained the use of his eyes and then he began to peer round him in a moment he found what he sought half upon and half hidden by the straw lay a young man in the deep sleep of utter exhaustion his face which bore traces of more than common beauty was now white and pinched 
his hair hung dank about his forehead his clothes were in rags and his feet bound up in pieces torn at random from his blouse were raw and bleeding for a short while michel tellier bent over him remarking these things with glistening eyes then the peasant stole out again it is five crowns he muttered blinking in the sunlight ha ha five crowns he looked round cautiously but could see no sign of his wife and after hesitating and pondering a minute or two he took the path for carbet his native astuteness leading him to saunter slowly along in his ordinary fashion after that the moorland about the cottage lay seemingly deserted thrice at intervals the girl dragged home her load of straw but each time she seemed to linger in the barn no longer than was necessary michel's absence though it was unlooked for raised no suspicion in her breast for he would frequently go down to the village to spend the afternoon the sun sank lower and the shadow of the great monolith which standing on the highest point of the moor about a mile away rose gaunt and black against a roseate sky grew longer and longer and then as twilight fell the two coming home met a few paces from the cottage he asked some questions about the work she had been doing and she answered briefly then silent and uncommunicative they went in together the girl set the bread and cider on the table and going to the great black pot which had been simmering all day upon the fire poured some broth into two pitchers it did not escape michel's frugal eye that there was still a little broth left in the bottom of the pot and this induced a new feeling in him anger when his wife hailed him by a sign to the meal he went instead to the door and fastened it thence he went to the corner and picked up the woodchopper and armed with this came back to his seat the girl watched his movements first with surprise and then with secret terror the twilight was come and the cottage was almost dark and she was alone with him or if not alone yet with no one near who could help her yet she met his grin of triumph bravely what is this she said why do you want that for the rat he answered grimly his eyes on hers why not use your stool she strove to murmur her heart sinking not for this rat he answered it might not do my girl oh i know all about it he continued i have been down to the village and seen the mare and he is coming up to fetch him he nodded towards the partition and she knew that her secret was known it is pierre she said trembling violently and turning first crimson and then white i know it jeanne it was excellent of you excellent it is long since you have done such a day's work you will not give him up my faith i shall he answered affecting and perhaps really feeling wonder at her simplicity he is five crowns girl you do not understand he is worth five crowns and the risk nothing at all if he had been angry or shown anything of the fury of the suspicious husband if he had been about to do this out of jealousy or revenge she would have quailed before him though she had done him no wrong save the wrong of mercy and pity but his spirit was too mean for the great passions he felt only the sordid ones which to a woman are the most hateful and instead of quailing she looked at him with flashing eyes i shall warn him she said it will not help him he answered sitting still and feeling the edge of the hatchet with his fingers i will help him she retorted he shall go he shall escape before they come i have locked the doors give me the key she panted give me the key i say she had risen and was standing before him her figure drawn to its full height he rose hastily and retreated behind the table still retaining the hatchet in his grasp stand back he said sullenly you may awaken him if you please my girl it will not avail him do you not understand fool that he is worth five crowns and listen it is too late now they are here a blow fell on the door as he spoke and he stepped towards it 
but at that despair moved her and she threw herself upon him and for a moment wrestled with him at last with an effort he flung her off and brandishing his weapon in her face kept her at bay you vixen he cried savagely retreating to the door with a pale cheek and his eyes still on her for he was an arrant coward you deserve to go to prison with him you jade i will have you in the stocks for this she leaned against the wall where she had fallen her white despairing face seeming almost to shine in the darkness of the wretched room meanwhile the continuous murmur of men's voices outside could now be heard mingled with the ring of weapons and the summons for admission was again and again repeated as if those without had no mind to be kept waiting patience patience i am opening he cried still keeping his face to her he unlocked the door and called on the men to enter he is in the straw monsieur le maire he cried in a tone of triumph his eyes still on his wife he will give you no trouble i will answer for it but first give me my five crowns mayor my five crowns he still felt so much fear of his wife that he did not turn to see the men enter and was taken by surprise when a voice at his elbow a strange voice said five crowns my friend for what may i ask in his eagerness and excitement he suspected nothing but thought only that the mayor had sent a deputy for what for the girondin he answered rapidly then at last he turned and found that half a dozen men had entered and that more were entering to his astonishment they were all strangers to him men with stern gloomy faces and armed to the teeth there was something so formidable in their appearance that his voice faltered as he added but where is the mayor gentlemen i do not see him no one answered but in silence the last of the men there were eleven in all entered and bolted the door behind him michel tellier peered at them in the gloom with growing alarm in return the tallest of the strangers who had entered first and seemed to be in command looked round keenly at length this man spoke so you have a girondin here have you he said his voice curiously sweet and sonorous i was to have five crowns for him michel muttered dubiously oh patience continued the spokesman to one of his companions can you kindle a light it strikes me that we have hit upon a dark place the man addressed took something from his pouch for a moment there was silence broken only by the sharp sound of the flint striking the steel then a sudden glare lit up the dark interior and disclosed the group of cloaked strangers standing about the door the light gleaming back from their muskets and cutlasses michel trembled he had never seen such men as these before true they were wet and travel-stained and had the air of those who spent their nights in ditches and under haystacks but their pale stern faces were set in indomitable resolve their eyes glowed with a steady fire and they trod as kings tread their leader was a man of majestic height and beauty and in his eyes alone there seemed to lurk a spark of some lighter fire as if his spirit still rose above the task which had sobered his companions michel noted all this in fear and bewilderment noted the white head and yet vigorous bearing of the man who had struck the light noted even the manner in which the light died away in the dim recesses of the barn and this girondin is he in hiding here said the tall man that is so michel answered but i had nothing to do with hiding him citizen it was my wife hid him in the straw there and you gave notice of his presence to the authorities continued the stranger raising his hand to repress some movement among his followers certainly or you would not have been here replied michel better satisfied with himself the answer struck him down with an awful terror that does not follow said the tall man coolly for we are girondins you are without doubt the other answered with majestic simplicity or there are no such persons this is patient and this citizen buzo have you heard of louvet there he stands for me i am barbaroux 
Michel's tongue seemed glued to the roof of his mouth. He could not utter a word, but another could. On the far side of the barrier a sudden rustling was heard, and while all turned to look, but with what different feelings, the pale face of the youth over whom Michel had bent in the afternoon appeared above the partition. A smile of joyful recognition effaced for the time the lines of exhaustion. The young man, clinging for support to the planks, uttered a cry of thankfulness. "'It is you! It is really you! You are safe!' he exclaimed. "'We are safe, all of us, Pierre,' Barbaroux answered. "'And now,' and he turned to Michel Tellier with sudden thunder in his voice, "'this man, whom you would have betrayed, is our guide, let me tell you, whom we lost last night. Speak, man, in your defence, if you can.' "'Say what you have to say why justice shall not be done upon you, miserable caitiff, who would have sold a man's life for a few pieces of silver.' The wretched peasant's knees trembled, and the perspiration stood upon his brow. He heard the voice as the voice of a judge. He looked in the stern eyes of the Girondin, and read only anger and vengeance. Then he caught in the silence the sound of his wife weeping for at Pierre's appearance she had broken into wild sobbing, and he spoke out of the base instincts of his heart. "'He was her lover,' he muttered. "'I swear it, citizens.' "'He lies!' cried the man at the barrier, his face transfigured with rage. "'I loved her, it is true, but it was before her old father sold her to this Judas. For what he would have you believe now, my friends, it is false. I, too, swear it.' A murmur of execration broke from the group of Girondins. Barbaru repressed it by a gesture. "'What do you say of this man?' he asked, turning to them, his voice deep and solemn. "'He is not fit to live,' they answered in chorus. The poor coward screamed as he heard the words, and flinging himself on the ground, he embraced Barbaru's knees in a paroxysm of terror, but the judge did not look at him. Barbaru turned instead to Pierre Bunat. "'What do you say of him?' he asked. "'He is not fit to live,' said the young man solemnly, his breath coming quick and fast. "'And you?' Barbaroux continued, turning and looking with his eyes of fire at the wife, his voice gentle and yet more solemn. A moment before she had ceased to weep, and had stood up listening and gazing, awe and wonder in her face. Barbaroux had to repeat his question before she answered. Then she said, "'He is not fit to die.' There was silence for a moment, broken only by the entreaties of the wretch on the floor. At last Barbaroux spoke. "'She has said rightly,' he pronounced. "'He shall live. They have put us out of the law and set a price on our heads, but we will keep the law. He shall live. But hark you,' the great orator continued, in tones which Michel never forgot. If a whisper escape you as to our presence here, or our names, or you wrong your wife by word or deed, the life she has saved shall pay for it. Remember, he added, shaking Michel to and fro with a finger, the arm of Barbaru is long, and though I be a hundred leagues away, I shall know, and I shall punish. So, beware. Now, rise and live the miserable man cowered back to the wall frightened to the core of his heart the girondin conferred a while in whispers two of their number assisting pierre to cross the barrier suddenly there came and michel trembled anew as he heard it a loud knocking at the door all started and stood listening and waiting a voice outside cried open open in the name of the law we have lingered too long barbaru muttered i should have thought of this it is the mayor of carbet come to apprehend our friend again the girondin conferred together at last seeming to arrive at a conclusion they ranged themselves on either side of the door and one of their number opened it a short stout man girt with a trickler sash and wearing a huge sword entered with an air of authority being blinded by the light he saw nothing out of the common and was followed by four men armed with muskets 
their appearance produced an extraordinary effect on michel tellier as they one by one crossed the threshold the peasant leaned forward his face flushed his eyes gleaming and counted them there were only five and the others were twelve he fell back and from that moment his belief in the girondin's power was clinched in the name of the law panted the mayor why did you not then he stopped abruptly his mouth remaining open he found himself surrounded by a group of grim silent mutes with arms in their hands and in a twinkling it flashed into his mind that these were the eleven chiefs of the girondin whom he had been warned to keep watch for he had come to catch a pigeon and had caught a crow he turned pale and his eyes dropped who are who are these gentlemen he stammered in a ludicrously altered tone some volunteers of Cumpon returning home replied barbaru with ironical smoothness you have your papers citizens the mayor asked mechanically and he took a step back towards the door and looked over his shoulder here they are said patient rudely thrusting a packet into his hands they are in order the mayor looked at them and longing only to see the outside of the door pretended to look through them his little heart going pitter-pat within him they seem to be in order he assented feebly i need not trouble you further citizen i came here under a misapprehension i find and i wish you a good journey he knew as he backed out that he was cutting a poor figure he would fain have made a more dignified retreat but before these men fugitives and outlaws as they were he felt though he was mayor of carbet almost as small a man as did michel tellier these were the men of the revolution they had bearded nobles and pulled down kings there was barbaru who had grappled with marat and patient the mayor of the bastille the little mayor of carbe knew greatness when he saw it he turned tail and hurried back to his fireside his bodyguard not a whit behind him five minutes later the men he feared and envied came out also and went their way passing in single file into the darkness which brooded over the great monolith beginning brave hearts another of the few stages which still lay between them and the guillotine then in the cottage there remained only michel and jeanne she sat by the dying embers silent and lost in thought he leaned against the wall his eyes roving ceaselessly but always when his gaze met hers it fell barbaru had conquered him it was not until jeanne had risen to close the door and he was alone that he wrung his hands and muttered five crowns five crowns gone and wasted end of in the name of the law by stanley j wayman isabel gives a new year's dinner and brings mother to the rescue by diana parrish this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook. Isabel gives a New Year's dinner and brings mother to the rescue. Fate seemed to be against Tom and Isabel's New Year's Eve dinner party from the start. The very day itself began with a blinding storm which made one very disagreeable it was so dark that she and tom were half an hour late in getting up the baby waked and hindered them with a peevish fretting so that tom was three-quarters of an hour later than usual when he dashed off the porch to catch a car for the office without kissing isabel good-bye both of them were annoyed that he should be late for work on the very day that he was going to bring his manager and his wife home for dinner. It looked as if he were making extraordinary preparations. Tom wanted the dinner to be without pretense, just the usual sort of dinner that they had every night. Isabel watched Tom from the door with her lace cap awry. Indeed, it came dangerously near covering completely one eye. In her dismay at not being kissed goodbye, she scarcely noticed it. Then 
Suddenly, bethinking herself of the task before her, she wheeled about. A puff of smoke from the chafing dish met her eye. Her nose told her that the electric current under it had not been turned off, and that the remains of the scrambled eggs from breakfast had been burned into abominable smelling gas. She switched off the current and carried the blackened pan to the kitchen. The burnt eggs struck her as being a bad omen. Isabel gathered the dishes into the sink, busily planning the while the best procedure for the day. The pastry must be made immediately after the dishes were finished. The thought of making pastry on the day of company was rather disturbing. Indeed, Isabel was conscious of a feeling of guilt when she recalled that she had spent the two days before in shopping and at parties instead of beginning preparations for the dinner for Mr. Benson and his wife. She wondered if she could not omit the pastry from her menu, but she remembered that Tom had asked especially to have green pea patties, as he had told Mr. Benson about the delicious ones Isabel could make, and had promised to let him sample them. No, Tom should not be disappointed, and Isabel splashed into the dishes so that she could make good her promise. As she dried the first plate, she heard a faint sound of crying from the bedroom. In her deep absorption, she had forgotten to feed and dress the baby. She listened again. The cries grew stronger, and she hastened in. Darling, do move a forget you? she gurgled. Tommy howled the louder, no doubt to show appreciation of his mother's attention. There, there, she soothed with queer little twists of the voice which we like to use on infants. But the infant could not be soothed, and while he was being bathed, dressed, and fed, he cried fretfully. Poor Isabel was nearly distracted when she finally got him into his little bed asleep. Mercy! It's half past eleven, she screamed, glancing at the clock, and I haven't done one thing. Isabel pondered. Better to give up the idea of pastry, but... Tom's promise to Mr. Benson. Why, oh why, had the boy promised to give the boss a taste of his wife's pastry? Again, Isabel resolved that her husband should not be disappointed. Leaving the dishes unfinished, she began on the pastry in order to get it into the ice chest to chill properly. Carefully, she measured the ingredients for the wonderful paste. A pound of flour and a pound of butter. Sift the flour, then work in part of the butter. Add sufficient ice water to make a dough of the right consistency. Isabel proceeded slowly with the intricate folding in of the remaining butter. How queer the butter seemed today. It was impossible to get it right. The flour seemed to stick to it in large lumps. Some of the flour was full of butter and some of it was totally without. She worked the paste round and round. In her anxiety, she worked it too long, and the paste formed into a sticky mass instead of crisp-looking dough. In desperation, she added a little more flour, hoping to get the right results. But it was no use. With disturbing visions beginning to haunt her, she pushed the stuff into the refrigerator. Then she turned hastily to her dishes. As she put her hands into the dishpan, she glanced nervously at the clock. She was shocked to see the fingers pointing to half-past one. She had spent two hours with the wretched paste. Horrified, she considered again. The mayonnaise must be made that very minute, if they were to have salad. It also must be chilled thoroughly. Isabel brought olive oil from the refrigerator and broke the yolks of two eggs into a bowl. She beat the eggs hurriedly, mentally chiding herself the while for so foolishly leaving her preparation until the last day. She added a pinch of salt to thicken the yolks and beat on and on, then a drop of oil into the eggs, beating slowly and carefully. A little more oil, more beating, and the dressing was beautifully thick and yellow. Now a spoonful of the lemon juice, and then the oil again. The rest was easy. The mayonnaise being well started, the oil could be poured in more rapidly. She turned in a thin stream, which thickened up quickly under the beater. She lifted the can again. A thin stream started slowly out and ended in drops. 
Isabel sank into a chair in consternation. The oil can was empty. With a sinking heart, she realized that it was Wednesday afternoon and the grocery stores were all closed. She also painfully remembered that the Bensons disliked any sort of boiled salad dressing. Isabel pulled herself together sharply. There was not a minute to be lost. Banishing the disturbing thoughts of the dishes and the untidy house, she brought in the chickens. She cut the string from the parcel and turned out two big fat chickens into a fresh bed of parsley. Joel, the Italian poultryman, had kept his word very well. I clean him very good, madam. I clean him very good. Encouraged by the appearance of the poultry, Isabel made haste with the stuffing, which was to be made with nothing less delectable than chestnuts. She opened the bag of nuts, and after determined and painful effort, succeeded in tearing them from their shells. Nothing daunted, she proceeded according to the directions of the cookbook, and poured boiling water over the wonderful nuts. Yes, Isabel was making chestnut stuffing for the first time. She was going against the oldest maximum her mother possessed. Never try a new dish for company. It seemed as if the boiling water created an immediate affinity between those nuts and their tough brown skins. Isabel gingerly pulled one of them out and tried to peel off the skin. It stuck like the proverbial paper on the wall. She tried another, and another, and another. She cut her finger with a sharp little knife. Then she tried another. At that moment the telephone rang frantically. It was a shock to Isabel. It woke Tommy up and started him crying. The bell kept on ringing. Isabel rushed to answer it. Hello, she shrieked. Hello? Number, please, cooed the cool, honey-sweet voice of the telephone operator. Number, screamed Isabel. Didn't you just ring here? Wrong number, floated over the wire, and the telephone switch clicked in Isabel's ear. She hung up the receiver and started toward the bedroom. Taking up the baby, she walked the floor with him. It was not scientific to do such a thing, but for that matter, the latest authorities on baby raising disapproved of picking the child up at all. He should be left to cry until he stopped. Anyway, she was not in a mood for science, so she patted the baby and bounced him about as she fretted over the dinner. I was silly to leave all these things until today, and I should have done what Tom told me to do, get Bessie to tend the baby. I... A dreadful squall from Tommy cut short her reflection. Whatever is the matter with this child? She walked hurriedly to and fro, swinging and swaying her son. She undid his clothes and made an exhaustive examination for any stray pins, which are the terror of the young mother's life. And still the child cried. Isabel was trembling now. She was terrified by the violent screams. Back and forth, back and forth, she paced utterly helpless to know what to do. Should she telephone Tom? Tom was probably busy with Mr. Benson. It might mean a disturbance. Should she telephone her mother? She didn't like to bother her mother. Anyway, who would hold the baby while she did telephone? Back and forth, back and forth. At length, she dropped into a chair, exhausted by the excitement and worry. Tears rolled down her cheeks and mingled with those of the howling baby. Just then, there was a slight tap at the door, and Mother, smiling brightly, pushed in. "'You poor dear,' began Mother, totally ignoring the appearance of the house. "'The baker boy told me he heard your baby crying, so I came over.' Isabel could not speak. She weakly handed the baby to her mother. Mother felt the child, examined his clothes, and then, laying him face downward over her arm, she walked into the kitchen. About what I thought, she murmured to herself as she poured boiling water over the powdered catnip leaves which she had ventured to bring along. While the tea steeped, she tried to soothe the child, who, seemingly affected by her very presence, quieted down to fitful squeaks. A little cream and a little sugar in the tea, and then, between squeals, Tommy was fed his catnip tea, mother's faithful cure-all. "'Will he be all right?' 
asked the frightened daughter, following her mother into the kitchen. Quite, answered mother. The very relief seemed to unnerve Isabel further. She wept unrestrainably, meanwhile telling mother of her distress. I should have done the pastry yesterday, all the things for that matter. Today everything I touched went wrong. The paste is a complete failure, and all my butter is gone except what I need for the table. My oil was gone, and I did not know it until too late, and I couldn't skin the horrid chestnuts, spluttered Isabel between sobs. Mother's eyebrows went up at the word chestnuts. Wisely, she refrained from asking questions. She tiptoed into the bedroom and laid the sleeping baby down. Now about dinner. She came back into the kitchen and glanced at the clock. Three o'clock. Without scruple, Mother rolled up the sleeves of her best afternoon blouse. She tied an apron around her waist. How would it be to serve the asparagus hot with butter and serve plain lettuce as a salad with that old Spanish dressing made of cream? Isabel nodded acquiescence. You run along and straighten these rooms and lay the table. I'll, I'll get these things started. In the face of disaster, Mother was the seasoned soldier. Isabel, the raw recruit. The way Mother whipped into that dinner was something to glory in. Under her swift fingers, a little flour, lard, salt, and water became crisp, crinkling patties of a perfect brown. Under her skillful hands, breadcrumbs, a little butter, finely minced onion, and seasoning became the savory filling that sent a tempting fragrance in the kitchen when the chickens went into the oven. A little whipped cream, thinned with a few drops of vinegar, sweetened with sugar, and toned up with paprika, developed into a salad dressing fit to grace a king's table. Isabel came into the kitchen and found the transformation. She knew what wizard deeds her mother could do, but it seemed to her they had never been so magical before. Now you get into your dinner dress, dear, and you will have time for a little rest. I'll take baby home with me and send Beatrice over to help you. Isabel choked up again. How can you be so wonderful, mother? How could I thank you or return the kindness? And however did you know how to manage the baby? Mother rolled down her sleeves slowly. Wait till you have seven. And she smiled her knowing little smile. End of Isabel Gives a New Year's Dinner and Brings Mother to the Rescue by Diana Farish. A Lost Day by Edgar Fawcett, 1847 to 1904. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. My family, John Dalrymple would say, have the strange failing, that is, nearly all of them except myself, on the paternal side, of, and then somebody would always try to interrupt him. At the Gramercy, the small but charming club of which he had been for years an honoured member, they made a point of interrupting him when he began on his family failing. Not a few of them held to the belief that it was a myth of Dalrymple's imagination. Still, others argued, all of the clan except John himself had been a queer lot. There was no real certainty that they had not done extraordinary acts. Meanwhile, apart from his desire to delve among ancestral records and repeat tales which had been told many times before, he was a genuine favourite with his friends. But that series of family anecdotes remained a standing joke. They all pitied him when it became known that his engagement to the pretty winsome widow, Mrs. Carrington, was definitely broken. He was past forty now, and had not been known to pay serious court to any woman before in at least ten years. Of course, Mrs. Carrington was rich, but then her money could not have attracted Dalrymple, for he was rich himself, in spite of his plain way of living, 
there in that small twenty-second street basement house. But the widow's money had doubtless lured to her side the gentleman who had cut poor Dalrymple out. A number of years ago, when this little occurrence which we are chronicling took place, it was not so easy as it is now to make sure of a foreigner's credentials and antecedents. The Count de Pomeroyal, a reputed French nobleman of high position, had managed to get into the Gramercy as a six-month member, and had managed also to cross the thresholds of numerous select New York drawing-rooms. At the very period of his introduction to Mrs. Carrington, her engagement with Dalrymple had already become publicly announced. Then, in a few weeks, society received a shock. Dalrymple was thrown over, and it transpired that the brilliant young widow was betrothed to the Count. Dalrymple, calm and self-contained, had nothing to say on the subject of why he had received such shabby treatment, and nobody ventured to interrogate him. Some people believed in the Count. Others thought that there was a ring of falsity about him, for all his frame was so elegantly slender and supple, for all his moustache was so glossily dark, and his eyes so richly lustrous. Dalrymple, meanwhile, hid his wound, met the Count constantly at the club, though no longer even exchanging bows with him, and worked at his revenge in secret as a beaver works at the building of his winter ranch. He succeeded, too, in getting superb materials for that revenge. They surprised even himself when a few relatives and friends in Paris mailed him appalling documentary evidence as to what sort of a character this Count really was. There is no doubt that he now held in his hand a thunderbolt and has only to hurl it when he pleased. He did not tell a single soul what he had learned. The thought of just how he should act haunted him for several days. One evening he went home from the club, a little earlier than usual, and tossed restlessly for a good while after going to bed. When sleep came it found him still irresolute as to what course he should take. It seemed to him that he had now a succession of dreams, but he could recall none of them on waking, and he awoke in a peculiar way. There was yet no hint of dawn in the room, and only the light from his gas turned down to a very dim star. He was sitting bolt upright in bed, and feverish, fatigued sensations oppressed him. What have I been dreaming? he asked himself again and again. But as only a confused jumble of memories answered him, he sank back upon the pillows, and was soon buried in slumber. It was past nine o'clock in the morning when he next awoke. He felt decidedly better. Both the feverishness and the fatigue had left him. He went to the club and breakfasted there. It was almost empty of members, as small clubs are apt to be at that hour of the morning. But in the hall he met his old friend Langworth and bowed to him. Langworth, who was rather near-sighted, gave a sudden start and a stare. How odd, thought Dalrymple, as he passed on into the reading room. I hope there's nothing unexpected about my personal appearance. Just at the doorway of the room he met another old friend. Summerson, a man extremely strict about all matters of propriety. Summerson saw him and then plainly made believe that he had not seen. As they moved by one another, Dalrymple said lightly, Good morning, old chap. How's your gout? Summerson, who was very tall and excessively dignified, gave a comic squirm. Then his eyelids fluttered and with the tips of his lips he murmured, Better, as he glided along. Pooh, said Dalrymple to himself. Getting touchy, I suppose, in his old age. How longevity disagrees with some of us mortals. He nearly always took a bottle of seltzer before breakfast, and this morning old Andrew, a servant who had been in the club many years, poured it out for him. "'I hope you're all right again this morning, sir,' said Andrew, with his Celtic accent and an affable half-whisper. "'All right, Andrew,' was the reply. "'Why, you must be thinking of someone else. I haven't been ill. My health has been excellent for a long time past.' 
"'Yes, sir,' said Andrew, lowering his eyes and respectfully retiring. That last, yes, sir, had a dubious note about its delivery that almost made Dalrymple call the faithful old fellow back and further question him. All right again, as if he'd ever been all wrong. Oh, well, poor Andrew was ageing. Others had remarked that fact months ago. A different servant came to announce breakfast. There were only about five men in the dining room as Dalrymple entered it. All of them gazed at him in an unusual way, or had late events led him to think they did so. At the table nearest him sat Everdell, one of the jolliest men in the club, a person whose face was nearly always wreathed in smiles. "'Good morning,' said Dalrymple, as he caught Everdell's eye. "'Good morning.' The tones were replete with mild consternation, and the look that went with them was smileless to the degree of actual gloom. Then Everdell, who had just finished his breakfast, rose and drew near to Dalrymple. "'Pon my word,' he said, "'I'm delighted to see you all right again so soon.' "'All right again so soon?' was the reply. "'What in mercy's name do you mean?' "'Oh, my dear old fellow,' began Everdell, fumbling with his watch-chain. "'It was pretty bad, you know, yesterday.' "'Pretty bad yesterday. "'I saw you in the morning, and for an hour or so in the afternoon. "'Perhaps no one would have noticed if you hadn't stayed here all day "'and poured those confidences into people's ears about de Pomeroy. "'You didn't appear to have drank a drop at the club.' there's the funny part of it you went out several times though and came back again all that you had to drink except some wine here at dinner you remember you must have got outside i wasn't here at ten o'clock when de pomeroy came in i'm glad i wasn't you must have been dreadful if Summerson and joyce hadn't rushed in between you and the count heaven knows what would have happened as it is at this point dalrymple broke in with cold harshness Look here, Everdell, I always dislike practical jokes, and I've known for a number of years that you're given to them. You've never attempted to make me your butt before, however, and you'll have the kindness to discontinue any such proceeding now. Everdell drew back for a moment, frowned, shrugged his shoulders, and then muttering, Oh, if you're going to put it in that way, strode quickly out of the dining room. Dalrymple scarcely ate a morsel of breakfast, after he had gulped down some hot coffee, he repaired to the reading-room. As he re-entered it, a waiter handed him several letters. One, which he opened first, was marked immediate, and had been sent him from his own house by an intelligent and devoted woman servant there, who had been for a long period in his employ. This letter made poor Dalrymple's head swim as he read it, written and signed by Mr. Summerson himself as chairman of the house committee of the club, it ordered him to appear that same evening before a meeting of the governors and answer to a charge of disorderly conduct on the previous night. Then it went on to state that he, Dalrymple, had been seen throughout the previous day at the club in a state of evident intoxication and had finally, between the hours of 10 and 11 p.m., accosted and grossly insulted the Count de Pomerul in the main drawing-room of the Gramercy. Disorderly conduct! evident intoxication grossly insulted the count de pomeroy these words were trembling on dalrymple's lips as he presently approached summerson himself the very gentleman who had signed the letter and who stood in the hall arrayed for the street what what does it all mean gasped dalrymple i i never was intoxicated in my life lawrence summerson you ought to know that I played euchre last night up in the card room from nine o'clock till twelve with Ogden and Folsom and yourself. If there's any practical joke being got up against me, for God's sake. Wait a minute, please, said Summerson. He went back into the coat room, disarrayed himself of his street wraps, and finally joined Dalrymple. His first words, low and grave, ran thus. Can it be possible you don't recollect that our game of euchre was played the night before last 
and not last night. Then he went with Dalrymple into a corner of the reading room, and they talked together for a good while. Dalrymple went back to his home that day in a mental whirl. It still wanted a number of hours before the governing committee would meet. He had lost a day out of his life. There could be no doubt of that. If he had moved about the club at all yesterday with a drunken manner, reviling de Pomeroy to everybody who would lend him an ear, if he had afterward met de Pomeroy in the club and directed towards him in loud and furious tones a perfect torrent of accusation, he himself was completely, blankly ignorant. For a good while he sat quite still and thought. Then he summoned Anne, the elderly and very trustworthy Anne, who had been his dear mother's maid, and was now his housekeeper. He questioned Anne, and after dismissing her he pondered her answers. Three times yesterday she had seen him, and regarding his appearance Anne had her distinct opinions. Suddenly a light flashed upon Dalrymple while he sat alone and brooded. He sprang up, and a cry, half of awe, half of gladness, left his lips. The baffling problem had been solved. That evening he presented himself before the governing committee. All assembled were sorry for him. Of course punishment must be dealt, but for an old and popular member like Dalrymple it must not be expulsion. The general feeling of the club had indeed already been gauged, and it was in favour of suspension for six months or a year at the farthest. Dalrymple, however, was determined that he should be visited with no punishment at all, and he meant to state why. The judges, as he faced them, all looked politely grim. The president, after a few soir preliminaries, asked Dalrymple if he had anything to say concerning the charges preferred against him. Dalrymple then proceeded to speak with a clear voice and composed demeanour. His first sentences electrified his hearers. "'I have no possible recollection of yesterday,' he began, "'and it is precisely as much of a lost day to me "'as though I had lain chloroformed for twenty-four hours. "'On Wednesday night I returned home from this club and went to rest. "'I never really woke until Friday.' possibly a little while after midnight, and then within my own bed. On Thursday morning I must have risen in a state of somnambulism, hypnotism, mental aberration, whatever you please, and not come to myself until Thursday had passed, and I had once more retired. Of what yesterday occurred I therefore claim to have been the irresponsible agent, and have become so through no fault of my own. I am completely innocent of the misdemeanours charged against me, and I now solemnly swear this on my word of honour as a gentleman. Here Dalrymple paused. The members of the committee interchanged glances amid profound silence. On some faces doubt could be read, but on others its veriest opposite. The intense stillness had become painful when Dalrymple spoke again. I had hoped that I should escape, throughout my own lifetime, all visitations of this distressing kind. My grandfather and two of my uncles not only walked in their sleep to an alarming degree, but were each subject to strange conditions of mind in which acts were performed by them that they could not possibly remember afterward. Here the speaker paused, soon continuing, however, in a lower and more reflective tone. Yes, my family have had the strange failing, that is, nearly all of them except myself, on the paternal side, of... But he said no more. The tension was loosened, and a great roar of laughter rose from the whole committee. How often every man there had joked with him about that marvellous budget of stories, which he infallibly began one way and one way only. And when the familiar formula sounded forth, it was all the funnier to those who had heard it because of the solemn judicial circumstances in which it again met their hearing. The plaintiff was honourably acquitted. As to de Pomeroy, as every word that Dalrymple had said concerning his past life in France happened to be perfectly true, the Count never reappeared at the Gramercy. 
His engagement with Mrs. Carrington was soon afterwards broken off by the lady herself, and for a good while it was rumoured that this lady had repentantly made it optional with Dalrymple whether he should once more become her accepted sweetheart. But Dalrymple remained a bachelor. He is quite an old man now, yet he may be found in the card room of the Gramercy nearly every evening. He is very willing to tell you the story of his lost day if you asked him courteously for it, and not in any strain of fun-poking. But he attempts no more voluntary recitals on the subject of his family's maladies or mishaps. End of a Lost Day by Edgar Fawcett Recording by Peter Tomlinson Love and Friendship and Other Early Works by Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chad Horner. Love and Friendship and Other Early Works by Jane Austen. Leslie Castle. Letter the first is from Miss Margaret Leslie to Miss Charlotte Luttrell. Leslie Castle, January third, seventeen ninety-two. My brother has just left us matilda said he at parting you and margaret will i am certain take all the care of my dear little one that she might have received from an indulgent and affectionate and amiable mother tears rolled down her cheeks as he spoke these words the remembrance of her who had so wantonly disgraced the maternal character and so openly violated the conjugal duties prevented his adding anything farther he embraced his sweet child and after saluting matilda and me hastily broke from us and seating himself in his chaise pursued the road to aberdeen never was there a better young man ah how little did he deserve the misfortunes he has experienced in the marriage state so good a husband to so bad a wife for you know my dear charlotte that the worthless louisa left him her child and reputation a few weeks ago in company with dambers and dishonour never was there a sweeter face a finer form or a less amiable heart than louisa owned her child already possessed the personal charms of her unhappy mother may she inherit from her father all his mental ones leslie is at present but five-and-twenty and has already given himself up to melancholy and despair what a difference between him and his father sir george is fifty-seven and still remains the view the flighty stripling the gay lad the springly youngster that his son was really about five years back and that he has affected to appear ever since my remembrance while our father is fluttering about the streets of london gay dissipated and thoughtless at the age of fifty-seven matilda and i continue scheduled from mankind in our old and mouldering castle which is situated two miles from perth on a bold projecting rock and commands an extensive view of the town and his delightful environs but though retired from almost all the world for we visit no one but the milliads the mackenzies the mcphersons the mccartneys the macdonalds the mckinnons the millilands the mckays the macbeths and the macduffs we are neither dull nor unhappy but on the contrary there never were two more lively more agreeable or more witty girls than we are not an hour in the day hangs heavy on our hands we read we work we talk and when fatigued with these employments relieve our spirits either by a lively song a graceful dance or by some smart bon mot and witty repartee we are handsome my dear charlotte very handsome and the greatest of our perfection is that we are entirely insensible of them ourselves but why do i thus dwell on myself let me rather repeat the praise of our dear little niece and the innocent louisa who is at present sweetly smiling in a gentle nap as she reposes on the sofa the dear creature is just turned of two years old as handsome as though two and twenty as sensible as though two and thirty and as prudent as though two and forty to convince you of this i must inform you that she has a very fine complexion and very pretty features that she already knows the two first letters in the alphabet and that she never tears her frocks if i have not now convinced you of her beauty sense and prudence i have nothing more to urge in support of my assertion 
and you will therefore have no way of deciding the affair but by coming to leslie castle and by a personal acquaintance with louisa determine for yourself ah my dear friend how happy should i be to see you within these venerable walls it is now four years since my removal from school has separated me from you that two such tender hearts so closely linked together by the ties of sympathy and friendship should be so widely removed from each other is vastly moving i live in perthshire you in sussex we might meet in london where my father disposed to carry me there and where your mother to be there at the same time we might meet at bath at tunbridge or anywhere else indeed could we but be at the same place together we have only to hope that such a period may arrive my father does not return to us till autumn my brother will leave scotland in a few days he is impatient to travel mistaken youth he vainly flatters himself that change of air will heal the wounds of a broken heart you will join with me and i am certain my dear charlotte in prayers for the recovery of the unhappy leslie's peace of mind which must ever be essential to that of your sincere friend m leslie end of letter the first is from miss margaret leslie to miss charlotte by jane austen this recording is in the public domain the middle toe of the right foot by ambrose bierce this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by richard steinberg the middle toe of the right foot it is well known that the old manton house is haunted in all the rural district near about and even in the town of marshall a mile away not one person of unbiased mind entertains a doubt of it incredulity is confined to those opinionated persons who will be called cranks as soon as the useful word shall have penetrated the intellectual domain of the martial advance the evidence that the house is haunted is of two kinds the testimony of disinterested witnesses who have had ocular proof and that of the house itself the former may be disregarded and ruled out on any of the various grounds of objection which may be urged against it by the ingenious but facts within the observation of all are material and controlling in the first place the manton house has been unoccupied by mortals for more than ten years and with its outbuildings is slowly falling into decay a circumstance which in itself the judicious will hardly venture to ignore it stands a little way off the loneliest reach of the marshall and harriston road in an opening which was once a farm and is still disfigured with strips of rotting fence and half covered with brambles overrunning a stony and sterile soil long unacquainted with the plough the house itself is in tolerably good condition though badly weather-stained and in dire need of attention from the glacier the smaller male population of the region having attested in the manner of its kind its disapproval of dwelling without dwellers it is two stories in height nearly square its front pierced by a single doorway flanked on each side by a window boarded up to the very top corresponding windows above not protected serve to admit light and rain to the rooms of the upper floor grass and weeds grow pretty rankly all about and a few shade trees somewhat the worse for wind and leaning all in one direction seem to be making a concerted effort to run away in short as the marshall town humorist explained in the columns of the advance the proposition that the manton house is badly haunted is the only logical conclusion from the premises the fact that in this dwelling mr manton thought it expedient one night some ten years ago to rise and cut the throats of his wife and two small children removing at once to another part of the country has no doubt done its share in directing public attention to the fitness of the place for supernatural phenomena to this house one summer evening came four men in a wagon three of them promptly alighted and the one who had been driving hitched the team to the only remaining post of what had been a fence the fourth remained seated in the wagon 
Come, said one of his companions, approaching him while the others moved away in the direction of the dwelling. This is the place. The man addressed did not move. By God, he said harshly, this is a trick, and it looks to me as if you were in it. Perhaps I am, the other said, looking him straight in the face and speaking in a tone which had something of contempt in it. You will remember, however, that the choice of place was with your own assent left to the other side. Of course, if you are afraid of spoos. I am afraid of nothing, the man interrupted, with another oath, and sprang to the ground. The two then joined the others at the door, which one of them had already opened with some difficulty, caused by rust of lock and hinge. All entered. Inside it was dark, but the man who had unlocked the door produced a candle and matches and made a light. He then unlocked a door on the right as they stood in the passage. This gave them entrance to a large square room that the candle but dimly lighted. The floor had a thick carpeting of dust, which partly muffled their footfalls. Cobwebs were in the angles of the walls and depended from the ceiling like strips of rotting lace, making undulatory movements in the disturbed air. The room had two windows and adjoining sides, but from neither could anything be seen except the rough inner surfaces of boards a few inches from the glass. There was no fireplace, no furniture, there was nothing. Beside the cobwebs and the dust, the four men were the only objects there which were not part of the structure. Strange enough, they looked in the yellow light of the candle. The one who had so reluctantly alighted was especially spectacular. He might have been called sensational. He was of middle age, heavily built, deep-chested, and broad-shouldered. Looking at his figure, one would have said that he had a giant's strength. At his features, that he would use it like a giant. He was clean-shaven, his hair rather closely cropped and gray. His low forehead was seamed with wrinkles above the eyes, and over the nose these became vertical. Heavy black brows followed the same law, saved from meeting only by an upward turn at what would otherwise have been the point of contact. Deeply sunken beneath these glowed in the obscured light a pair of eyes of uncertain color, but obviously enough too small. There was something forbidding in their expression, which was not bettered by the cruel mouth and wide jaw. The nose was well enough as noses go. One does not expect much of noses. All that was sinister in the man's face seemed accentuated by an unnatural pallor. He appeared altogether bloodless. The appearance of the other men was sufficiently commonplace. They were such persons as one meets and forgets that he met. All were younger than the man described, between whom and the eldest of the others, who stood apart, there was apparently no kindly feeling. They avoided looking at each other. Gentlemen, said the man holding the candle and keys, I believe everything is right. Are you ready, Mr. Rosser? The man, standing apart from the group, bowed and smiled. And you, Mr. Grossmith? The heavy man bowed and scowled. You will be pleased to remove your outer clothing. Their hats, coats, waistcoats, and neckwear were soon removed and thrown outside the door in the passage. The man with the candle now nodded, and the fourth man, he who had urged Grossmith to leave the wagon, produced from the pocket of his overcoat two long, murderous-looking bowie knives, which he drew now from their leather scabbards. They are exactly alike, he said, presenting one to each of the two principals for by this time the dullest observer would have understood the nature of this meeting. It would be a duel to the death. Each combatant took a knife, examined it critically near the candle, and tested the strength of the blade and handle across his lifted knee. Their persons were then searched in turn, each by the second of the other. If it is agreeable to you, Mr. Grossmith, said the man holding the light, you will place yourself in that corner. He indicated the angle of the room farthest from the door, whither Grossmith retired, his second parting from him with a grasp of the hand which had nothing of cordiality in it. In the angle nearest the door, Mr. Rosser stationed himself, and after a whispered consultation his second left him, joining the other near the door. 
At that moment, the candle was suddenly extinguished, leaving all in profound darkness. This may have been done by the draft from the open door. Whatever the cause, the effect was startling. Gentlemen, said a voice, which sounded strangely unfamiliar in the altered condition affecting the relations of the senses. Gentlemen, you will not move until you hear the closing of the outer door. A sound of trampling ensued, then the closing of the inner door, and finally the outer one closed with a concussion which shook the entire building. A few minutes afterward, a belated farmer's boy met a light wagon, which was being driven furiously toward the town of Marshall. He had declared that behind the two figures on the front seat stood a third, with its hands upon the bowed shoulders of the others, who appeared to struggle vainly to free themselves from its grasp. This figure, unlike the others, was clad in white, and had undoubtedly boarded the wagon as it passed the haunted house. As the lad could boast a considerable former experience with the supernatural thereabouts, his words had the weight justly due to the testimony of an expert. The story, in connection with the next day's events, eventually appeared in the advance, with some slight literary embellishments and a concluding intimation that the gentleman referred to would be allowed the use of the paper's columns for their version of the night's adventure, but the privilege remained without a claimant. The events that led up to this duel in the dark were simple enough. One evening, three young men of the town of Marshall were sitting in a quiet corner of the porch of the village hotel, smoking and discussing such matters as three educated young men of a southern village would naturally find interesting. Their names were King, Sancher, and Rosser. At a little distance, with an easy hearing, but taking no part in the conversation, sat a fourth. He was a stranger to the others. They merely knew that on his arrival by the stagecoach that afternoon, he had written in the hotel register the name Robert Grossmith. He had not been observed to speak to anyone except the hotel clerk. He seemed, indeed, singularly fond of his own company, or, as the personnel of the advance expressed it, grossly addicted to evil associations. But then it should be said, in justice to the stranger, that the personnel was himself of a too convivial disposition fairly to judge one differently gifted, and had, moreover, experienced a slight rebuff in an effort at an interview. I hate any kind of deformity in a woman, said King, whether natural or acquired. I have a theory that any physical defect has its correlative mental and moral defect. I infer then, said Grosser gravely, that a lady lacking the moral advantage of a nose would find the struggle to become Mrs. King an arduous enterprise. Of course, you may put it that way, was the reply, but seriously, I once threw over a most charming girl on learning quite accidentally that she had suffered amputation of a toe. My conduct was brutal, if you like, but if I had married that girl, I should have been miserable for life and should have made her so. Whereas, said Sancher, with a light laugh, by marrying a gentleman of more liberal views, she escaped with a parted throat. Ah, you know to whom I refer. Yes, she married Manton, but I don't know about his liberality. I'm not sure, but he cut her throat because he discovered that she, lacking that excellent thing in a woman, the middle toe of the right foot. Look at that chap, said Rosser in a low voice, his eyes fixed upon the stranger. That chap was obviously listening to the conversation. Damn his impudence, muttered King. What ought we to do? That's an easy one, Rosser replied, rising. Sir, he continued addressing the stranger, I think it would be better if you were to remove your chair to the other end of the veranda. The presence of gentlemen is evidently an unfamiliar situation to you. The man sprang to his feet and strode forward with clenched hands, his face white with rage. All were now standing. Sancher stepped between the belligerents. You are hasty and unjust, he said to Rosser. This gentleman has done nothing to deserve such language. But Rosser would not withdraw a word. By the custom of the country and the time there could be but one outcome to the quarrel. I demand the satisfaction due to a gentleman, said the stranger, who had become more calm. I have not an acquaintance in this region. Perhaps you, sir, bowing to Sancher, 
would be kind enough to represent me in this matter. Sancher accepted the trust, somewhat reluctantly, it must be confessed, for the man's appearance and manner were not at all to his liking. King, who during the colloquy had hardly removed his eyes from the stranger's face and had not spoken a word, consented with a nod to act for Rosser, and the upshot of it was that, the principals having retired, a meeting was arranged for the next evening. The nature of the arrangements has been already disclosed. The duel with knives in a dark room was once a commoner feature of southwestern life than it is likely to be again. How thin a veneering of chivalry covered the essential brutality of the code under which such encounters were possible, we shall see. In the blaze of a midsummer noonday, the old Manton house was hardly true to its traditions. It was, of the earth, earthly. The sunshine caressed it warmly and affectionately, with evident disregard of its bad reputation. The grass greening all the expanse in its front seemed to grow, not rankly, but with a natural and joyous exuberance, and the weeds blossomed quite like plants, full of charming lights and shadows and populous with pleasant-voiced birds. The neglected shade trees no longer struggled to run away, but bent reverently beneath their burden of sun and song. Even in the glassless upper windows was an expression of peace and contentment, due to the light within. Over the stony fields the visible heat danced with a lively tremor incompatible with the gravity which is an attribute of the supernatural. Such was the aspect under which the place presented itself to Sheriff Adams and two other men who had come from Marshall to look at it. One of these men was Mr. King, the sheriff's deputy. The other, whose name was Brewer, was a brother of the late Mrs. Manton. Under a beneficent law of the state relating to property, which had been for a certain period abandoned by an owner whose residence cannot be ascertained, the sheriff was legal custodian of the Manton farm and appurtenances thereunto belonging. His present visit was in mere perfunctory compliance with some order of a court in which Mr. Brewer had an action to get possession of the property as heir to his deceased sister. By a mere coincidence, the visit was made on the day after the night the deputy king had unlocked the house for an other and very different purpose. His presence now was not of his own choosing. He had been ordered to accompany his superior and at the moment could think of nothing more prudent then simulated alacrity in obedience to the command. Carelessly opening the front door, which to his surprise was not locked, the sheriff was amazed to see, lying on the floor of the passage into which it opened, a confused heap of men's apparel. Examination showed it to consist of two hats and the same number of coats, waistcoats, and scarves, all in remarkably good state of preservation, albeit somewhat defiled by the dust in which they lay. Mr. Brewer was equally astonished, but Mr. King's emotion is not on record. With a new and lively interest in his own actions, the sheriff now unlatched and pushed open the door on the right, and the three entered. The room was apparently vacant. No. As their eyes became accustomed to the dimmer light, something was visible in the farthest angle of the wall. It was a human figure, that of a man crouching close in the corner. Something in the attitude made the intruders halt when they had barely passed the threshold. The figure more and more clearly defined itself. The man was upon one knee, his back in the angle of the wall, his shoulders elevated to the level of his ears, his hands before his face, palms outward, the fingers spread in crooked like claws. The white face turned upward on the retracted neck, had an expression of unutterable fright, the mouth half open, the eyes incredibly expanded. He was stone dead. Yet, with the exception of a bowie knife, which had evidently fallen from his own hand, not another object was in the room. In thick dust that covered the floor were some confused footprints near the door and along the wall through which it opened. Along one of the adjoining walls, too, past the boarded-up windows, was the trail made by the man himself in reaching his corner. Instinctively in approaching the body, the three men followed that trail. The sheriff grasped one 
of the outthrown arms. It was as rigid as iron, and the application of a gentle force rocked the entire body without altering the relation of its parts. Brewer, pale with excitement, gazed intently into the distorted face. God of mercy, he suddenly cried, it is Manton. You are right, said King, with an evident attempt at calmness. I knew Manton. He then wore a full beard and his hair long, but this is he. He might have added, I recognized him when he challenged Rosser. I told Rosser and Sancher who he was before we played him this horrible trick. When Rosser left this dark room at our heels, forgetting his outer clothing in the excitement and driving away with us in his shirt sleeves, all through the discreditable proceedings we knew who we were dealing with, murderer and coward that he was. But nothing of this did Mr. King say. With his better light, he was trying to penetrate the mystery of the man's death, that he had not once moved from the corner where he had been stationed, that his posture was that of neither attack nor defense, that he had dropped his weapon, that he had obviously perished of sheer horror of something that he saw. These were circumstances which Mr. King, disturbed intelligence, could not rightly comprehend. Groping in intellectual darkness for a clue to his maze of doubt, his gaze directed mechanically downward in the way of one who ponders momentous matters, felt upon something which there, in the light of day, and in the presence of living companions, affected him with terror. In the dust of years that lay thick upon the floor, heading from the door by which they had entered, straight across the room to within a yard of Manton's crouching corpse, were three parallel lines of footprints. Light but definite impressions of bare feet, the outer ones those of small children, the inner of a woman's. From the point at which they ended, they did not return. They pointed all one way. Brewer, who had observed them at the same moment, was leaning forward in an attitude of rapt attention, horribly pale. Look at that, he cried, pointing with both hands at the nearest print of the woman's right foot where she had apparently stopped and stood. The middle toe is missing. It was Gertrude. Gertrude was the late Mrs. Manton, sister of Mr. Brewer. End of the Middle Toe of the Right Foot by Ambrose Bierce Wonder Tales from Many Lands by Catherine Pyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Wonder Tales from Many Lands by Catherine Pyle. Chapter 11. Rabbit's Eyes. A Korean Fairy Tale. Once upon a time the king of the fishes fell ill, and no one knew what was the matter with him. All the doctors in the sea were called in, one after another, and not one of them could cure him. Once when the fishes were talking about it, a turtle stuck its head out of a crack in a rock. It is a pity, said the turtle, that no one has ever thought of asking my advice. I could cure the king in a twinkling. All he has to do is to swallow the eye of a live rabbit, and he will become perfectly well again. This the turtle said, not because he knew anything at all about the matter, but because he wished to appear wise before the fishes. Now it so chanced that one of the fishes that heard him was the son of the king's counsellor, and he swam straight home and told his father what he had heard the turtle say. The counsellor told the king, and the king, who was feeling very ill that day, bade them bring the turtle to him immediately. When the messengers told the turtle that the king wished to speak to him, the turtle was very much frightened. He drew his head and his tail into his shell and pretended that he was asleep, but in the end he was obliged to go with the messengers. They soon reached the palace, and the turtle was taken immediately to where the king was. He was lying on a bed of seaweed and looking very ill indeed, and all his doctors were gathered round him. The king turned his eyes toward the turtle, and spoke in a weak voice. Tell me, friend, is it true that you said you could cure me? Yes, it is true, and that all I have to do is to swallow the eye of a live rabbit, and I will be well again? Yes, that was true too. Then go get a live rabbit and bring it here immediately, that I may be well. When the turtle heard these words, he was in despair. 
it did not seem at all likely that he could catch a rabbit and bring it down into the sea but he was so much afraid of the king that he did not care to explain this to him he said nothing but crawled away as soon as he could wishing he could find some crack where he could hide himself and never be found again suddenly he remembered he had once seen a rabbit frisking about on a hill not far from the seashore and he determined to set out to find it he crawled out of the sea and started up the hill he climbed and he climbed and after a while he came to the top and there he sat down to rest presently along came the rabbit and it stopped to speak to him good day said the rabbit good day said the turtle and what are you doing so far away from the sea asked the rabbit oh i only came up here to look out and see what the green world was like answered the turtle and what do you think of it now you're here oh it's not so bad but you ought to see the beautiful palaces and gardens we have down under the sea the turtle began telling the rabbit about them and he talked so long and said so many fine things about them that the rabbit began to wish to see them for himself would it be very hard for me to live down under the water he asked oh no said the turtle it might be a little inconvenient at first but that would not last long if you like i will take you on my back and carry you down to the bottom of the sea and then you can see whether it is not all just as grand and beautiful as i have been telling you well the rabbit could not resist his curiosity and he agreed to go with the turtle they went to the edge of the sea and then the rabbit got on the turtle's back and down they went through the water to the very bottom of the sea the rabbit did not like it at first but he soon grew used to it and when he saw all the fine palaces and gardens that were there he was filled with wonder the turtle took him directly to the palace of the king there he bade the rabbit get down and wait a while and he promised that presently he would show him to the king of all this magnificence the rabbit was delighted and willingly agreed to wait there while the turtle went to announce him but while the turtle was away the rabbit heard two fishes talking in the room next to where he was he was very inquisitive so he cocked his ears forward and listened to what they were saying what was his horror to find that they were talking about taking out his eyes and giving them to the king the rabbit did not know what to do nor how he was to escape from the dangerous position he was in presently the turtle came back and the chief counsellor came with him and immediately the rabbit began to talk well said he it all seems very fine here and i am glad i came but i wish now i had brought my own eyes with me so that i could see it better you see the eyes i have in my head now are only glass eyes i am so afraid of getting my own eyes hurt or dusty that i generally keep them in a safe place and wear these glass eyes instead but if i had only known how much there would be to look at i would certainly have brought my own eyes when the turtle and the counsellor heard this they were very much disappointed for they believed the rabbit was speaking the truth and that the eyes he had in his head at the time were only glass eyes i will take you back to the shore said the turtle and then you can go and get your real eyes and come back again for there are many more things for you to see here things more wonderful and beautiful than anything i have yet shown you well the rabbit was willing to do that so we got upon the turtle's back and the turtle swam up and up with him through the sea as soon as they reached the shore the rabbit leaped from the turtle's back and away he went up the hill as fast as he could scamper and he was glad enough to be out of that scrap i can tell you but the turtle waited and he waited and he waited but the rabbit never came back and at last the turtle was obliged to go home without him as for the king of the fishes if he ever got well it was not the eye of a live rabbit that cured him of that you may be sure end of chapter eleven rabbit's eyes a korean fairy tale by catherine pyle sergeant warren comes back from france by fisher ames jr this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org sergeant warren comes back from france immediately after voting the reverend jeremiah soul stepped outside the town hall to fortify himself with fresh air for the coming meeting several others had done the same been a hard winter mr soul politely remarked one of the loiterers about the door he was clad for the gusts of march like a sealer about to venture forth upon an arctic flow and especially for the boys in the trenches said the minister that's a fact sir i didn't mean we ought to complain we had our fair share of coal and wood i guess the wood was green and the 
coal mostly slate and we had the money to pay for it the group of men stirred a little uneasily honestly made i think you'll admit that sir said arthur watts a strapping fellow of thirty years who had been called in the first draft and rejected on a count of his poor teeth i believe so quite admitted mr sole we are making good rope for the government and our allies and no one is better pleased over it than i i am proud of the cordage plant yes since this dreadful war had to be the town has come honestly enough by its prosperity the group felt that mr sole had tactfully dodged the real issue and they were content to have it so just then the polls were closed and those who had brought lunch boxes proceeded to consume the contents others presented themselves at the ante-room where george bassett was dispensing his famous chowder and coffee together with pickles and bread and butter it frets the parson to see us keeping our money instead of blowing it all out in charity remarked watts across a steaming mug of strong coffee he laughed indulgently his friends did not echo his amusement they looked if not exactly ill at ease at any rate somewhat sober the hall was packed when joel holmes a massive and imperturbable person was chosen moderator for the tenth successive time warrant in one large hand and gavel in the other he inscrutably stared upon the expectant voters for a weighty minute the meeting will please come to order he announced the gavel smote the desk resoundingly as usual the first person to be recognized was fiery little mr abel crabb who had a few withering remarks to make concerning the warrant as a whole he was greatly applauded as a conscientious objector to everything abel was looked upon as an interesting feature of town meeting a number of articles were then discussed and disposed of without excitement until henry tory rose he was as much of an objector as mr crabb but he dealt in irony rather than in blunt scorn with a grim smile he proceeded to ridicule the library directors when he had exposed them in their true colors he made an impassioned motion to have the appropriation they asked for in article six of the warrant the motion was enthusiastically seconded but on being put to vote tories was the only i the crowd enjoyed tory as they enjoyed abel crabb but they had perfect faith in the library directors the town officers and the warrant early in the proceedings it was evident that article number ten was to furnish the event of the day it ran as follows that the sum of twenty five thousand dollars be appropriated for the improvement and embellishment of farragut square said improvement to include the removal of the four old buildings now abutting upon it the erection of a flagpole and a suitable bandstand and the widening of brig street on the bay side of the square when the article was reached no disposition was shown to dispose of it quickly fenwell wished to hear the report of the committee and the opinions and impressions of each and every member thereon the plan had caught the popular fancy nearly every man there was ready to back it firmly even boastfully pompous mr baxter the chairman of the committee sounded the keynote he sketched the history of the cordage plant which had begun as an uninspiring rope walk he compared it to the ugly duckling that became a regal swan and the swan he said pursuing the simile had not flown out of their hands in spite of the great wings it had grown at this point the moderator's voice and gavel were called upon to quell a disturbance in the rear of the hall apparently occasioned by the entrance of some late arrivals when order was restored mr baxter continuing the peon to the town's prosperity spoke of the uniquely local character of the cordage plant of the fact that virtually everyone from the president down to the office boy concerned with it was a native of fenville and besides a liberal salary everyone had a share in the profits nearly every penny of the stock was owned right in the town of fenville all of which was no news but every one relished baxter's glowing phrases just the same the speeches of the other committee men were 
in the same tenor fenville had made money out of its cordage was still making money it could afford to pat its own back and the pat might well take the form of a renovated and beautified town square that would advertise its business smartness to all beholders as the last of the committee men sat down some one in the rear of the hall addressed the moderator mr queried that official unable to see the speaker clearly like the old hall recently destroyed by fire the new structure had made a concession to the fair and inquisitive sex in the shape of a deep rear balcony warren miles warren an excited cranny of heads followed and even joel holmes showed the human being beneath the armor of officialdom miles warren he ejaculated then his gavel mechanically reminded him of his duties and he recalled the meeting to order it took vigorous rapping to still the persistent murmurs and the eager turnings i'd like to say a few words about article ten said the man under the low balcony well i guess you can boomed the moderator he was preserving his self-control with difficulty his hands fidgeted and his circular face showed a deepening crimson but we can't hear what you say way back there or see you either he added please step a little farther forward if you will mr warren the storm of welcoming applause for the son who had so unexpectedly returned to his native town after two years of splendid service in the far-famed foreign legion suddenly fell to a shocked silence they saw now why sergeant warren had come home his father stood beside him miles needed some one to guide him up the narrow aisle for he was blind fenville had heard of the metal cross pinned to the faded tunic and had shared the pride of john warren and his wife abigail but it had not been heard of the scarred face and sightless eyes miles had gone forth to fight for democracy like a true knight of old the fenville weekly gazette had said the townspeople had not smiled at the phrase for there had always been something gallant in miles he had always had a fearless and honorable outlook upon life i'm not much used to them over there so it seems good to get home he said and on town meeting day i saw father wanted to be here and i did too so we came right over from the depot sightless thrown back into the discard but there was the same firm mouth and the same upright carriage of the well-shaped head broken not a bit of it everyone could see that the old spirit was there just as gallant as when he had set out for the battlefields of france this article number ten continued the sergeant you don't know how strange it sounds because i've come straight home from over there you know i was i was going to say without seeing anything on the way he smiled and that's true too what i mean is i haven't had time to get adjusted to the change it wasn't until just now that i said to myself the war's thousands of miles off way across the ocean not that the ocean could stop fritz from getting at us mighty quick if he ever beats us over there you may depend on that someone has to make the things that are needed and get paid for them that's of course but i haven't been seeing that side i've been seeing france and england and our own boys with their backs to the wall i've been seeing new graveyards grow bigger than big towns as big as cities in cities that were nothing but graveyards towns that were nothing but ash heaps rich lands churned up into terrible deserts and i've met men met them all the time who'd been seeing the same and worse in russia and poland serbia and romania the whole christian world being battered and ripped to pieces that is the way you think about it over there what can you do to stop it how can you help the millions that have lost their fathers or mothers husbands or wives or children that have no food or homes or country that is what you ask yourself day and night you can never give them back what they have lost but if you had money you could keep some of them from dying of cold and hunger little children at least that is about all money means to you over there so when i came home to hear that fenville has grown rich why i can't seem to sense it and that you want to fix up farragut square make it pretty buy the town a kind of decoration because it has been lucky enough and 
smart enough to make money out of the war it's like blood money to me like blood itself a drop for every penny fenville had never tolerated criticism but the man in the faded uniform with the cross on his tunic and his head up and his poor blind scarred face exerted a strange influence over the audience even the least imaginative man had his vision on what that figure symbolized it was looking at him as much as hearing him speak why i seemed to get a sight right over to france as clear as if i had been there explained mr totten afterwards france made farragut square look kind of small i'll say just one thing more miles went on and you could have heard a pin drop in that hall if any of our boys don't come back lem chapman and frank keeler and the others those that do will they think a prettified farragut square is the best monument for the ones who died for us over there the sergeant turned and john warren took hold of his arm to lead him back mr chapman lem's father was up like a flash hold on he shouted no it ain't by jupiter crash out came the hand clapping like the rattle of rifle fire more than one shrewd old eye was moist and few were the hearts that did not beat with a more generous quickness what can we do sergeant miles asked mr chapman you have told us what we shouldn't do and i for one thank you for it we want to do the right thing every man of us here does tell us what it is let us dispose of article ten first said dr shepherd the house approved and mr chapman gave way the article was put in the form of a motion was voted upon and defeated as if it had never had a friend in the world make a motion miles shouted a score of voices do you want to know what i should do said the soldier there are places in france and belgium that used to be towns some haven't even the cellars left an american society has been formed to take hold of the work of building up those places after the war we could write to that society and get the name of a town that once was a little one one where perhaps her own boys have fought fenville could put the money she meant to spend on herself into helping to make it a town again it would help don't you worry about that so fenville could feel always long after our time that that little french town was her comrade and it would be her bit fenville's bit when he could make himself heard the reverend jeremiah soul made a motion the gist of which was that a committee be appointed to correspond with the society with the object of learning the name of some small devastated town in france or belgium that would be a worthy recipient of twenty five thousand dollars from fenville's treasury the same to be expended toward rebuilding the town at the end of the war a dozen voices seconded the motion and on being put to a vote it was carried unanimously mr crabb the conscientious objector was one of the first to rise on the i vote the fiery little man had his streak of sentiment after all so had henry tory who said gruffly that he was glad to see the town's money spent for a really useful purpose for once three cheers for sergeant warren then shouted mr chapman and make them rousers he and john went out said a voice in the rear of the hall cheer him from the steps cried another the crowd filed out the two warrens were walking down the road the sergeant had his father's arm but his head up and it was not he but the older man that had the air of being led for some reason the crowd fell silent finally someone said crisply miles warren always could see straight and i tell you he can see as straight as ever even if he is blind end of sergeant warren comes back from france by fisher ames jr the story of the sibylline books and king tarquinius superbus by aulus gellius one twenty five to one eighty a d from the attic nights volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org
in the ancient annals this story is related of the sibylline books footnote the sibylline books the sibyls and the oracles called sibylline present an almost inexhaustible subject for critical and learned investigation my object is the general information of the less informed english reader the sibyls were women presumed to have the power of predicting future events of these there were many but the precise number is disputed their origin is derived from persia but their talent of prophesying was supposed to be derived from the influence of the constellation called virgo in the natural world the verses collected and published under the name of the sibylline oracles are universally allowed to be spurious but it is evident that the romans in particular revered these predictions as sacred and on all important occasions consulted them ten or as gellius and some others affirm fifteen eminent romans were appointed to superintend and examine them the most celebrated of the sibyls were the erethian the delphic and the cumian and the books above mentioned were preserved till the times of the civil wars between scylla and marius and footnote an old woman who was an utter stranger went to tarquin the proud when king carrying with her nine books which she said were divine oracles she offered to sell them tarquin inquired the price the old woman asked an immense and extravagant sum the king supposing her to dote from age laughed at her she kindled a fire and burned three of the nine books and then asked the king to buy the remaining six at the same price on this tarquin derided her still more and told her that doubtless she was mad the woman immediately burned three more books and at the same time mildly asked him if he would purchase the three that were left at the same price tarquin then assumed a more serious aspect and began to deliberate he perceived that this consistency and firmness was not to be disregarded he purchased the last three books at the same price that was demanded for the whole but this woman having left tarquin's presence was never afterwards to be found they were called the sibylline books and deposited in a sacred place when the immortal gods were publicly to be consulted the fifteen go to these as an oracle end of the story of the sibylline books and king tarquinius superbus by aulus gellius The Bible, King James Version, Book 22, Song of Solomon, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Book 22, Song of Solomon. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine because of the savour of thy good ointments thy name is as ointment poured forth therefore do the virgins love thee draw me we will run after thee the king hath brought me into his chambers we will be glad and rejoice in thee we will remember thy love more than wine the upright love thee i am black but comely o ye daughters of jerusalem as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of solomon look not upon me because i am black because the sun hath looked upon me my mother's children were angry with me they made me the keeper of the vineyards but mine own vineyard have i not kept tell me o thou whom my soul loveth where thou feedest where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon for why should i be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions if thou know not o thou fairest among women go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents i have compared thee o my love to a company of horses in pharaoh's chariots thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels thy neck with chains of gold we will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver while the king sitteth at his table 
my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof a bundle of myrrh is my well beloved unto me he shall lie all night betwixt my breasts my beloved is unto me as a cluster of campfire in the vineyards of Engedi. behold thou art fair my love behold thou art fair thou hast dove sighs behold thou art fair my beloved yea pleasant also our bed is green the beams of our house are cedar and our rafters of fir i am the rose of sharon and the lily of the valleys as the lily among the thorns so is my love among the daughters as the apple tree among the trees of the wood so is my beloved among the sons i sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love stay me with flagons comfort me with apples for i am sick of love his left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me i charge you o ye daughters of jerusalem by the rose and by the hinds of the field that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please the voice of my beloved behold he cometh leaping upon the mountains skipping upon the hills my beloved is like a roe or a young heart behold he standeth behind our wall he looketh forth at the windows showing himself through the lattice my beloved spake and said unto me rise up my love my fair one and come away for lo the winter is past the rain is over and gone the flowers appear on the earth the time of the singing of birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land the fig tree putteth forth her green figs and the vines with tender grape give a good smell arise my love my fair one and come away o my dove that art in the clefts of the rock in the secret places of the stairs let me see thy countenance let me hear thy voice for sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is comely take us the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vines for our vines have tender grapes my beloved is mine and i am his he feedeth among the lilies until the day break and the shadows flee away turn my beloved and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of bether by night on my bed i sought him whom my soul loveth i sought him but i found him not i will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broad ways i will seek him whom my soul loveth i sought him but i found him not the watchmen that go about the city find me to whom i said saw ye him whom my soul loveth it was but a little that i passed from them but i found him whom my soul loveth i held him and would not let him go until i had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me i charge you o ye daughters of jerusalem by the rose and by the hinds of the field that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all powders of the merchant behold his bed which is solomon's threescore valiant men are about it of the valiant of israel they all hold swords being expert in war every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night king solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of lebanon he made the pillars thereof of silver the bottom thereof of gold the covering of it of purple the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of jerusalem go forth o ye daughters of zion and behold king solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals and in the day of the gladness of his heart behold thou art fair my love behold thou art fair thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from mount gilead thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn which came up from the washing whereof every one bear twins and none is barren among them thy lips are like a thread of scarlet and thy speech is comely thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy logs thy neck is like the tower of david builded for an armory whereon there hang a thousand bucklers all shields of mighty men thy two breasts are like two young roes that are twins which feed among the lilies until the daybreak and the shadows flee away i will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense thou art all fair my love there is no spot in thee come with me from lebanon my spouse with me from lebanon look from the top of amana 
from the top of Janir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices? Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop us the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates, with pleasant fruits, campfire and spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden, and eat his pleasant fruits. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my mirror and my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I devile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with mirror, and my fingers with sweet-smelling mirror upon the handles of the log. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself, and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me, they smote me, they wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thy fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved, that thou dost so charge us? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His teeth are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling mirror. His hands are as gold rings, set with the beryl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble, set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? My beloved is gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines, and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley, and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of a minute. Return, return, O Shilamite, Return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will ye see in the Shilamite, as it were the company of two armies? How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter! The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. 
the work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like two young roes that are twins. Thy neck is as a tower of ivory. Thine eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bathrabim. Thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel, and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delights! This thy stature is like to a palm tree, and thy breasts to clusters of grapes. I said I will go up to the palm tree, I will take hold of the boughs thereof. Now also thy breasts shall be as clusters of the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples and the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved that goeth down sweetly causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak i am my beloved's and his desire is toward me come my beloved let us go forth into the field let us lodge in the villages let us get up early to the vineyards let us see if the vine flourish whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth there will i give thee my loves the mandrakes give a smell and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. O that thou wert as my brother, that sucked the breast of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee. Yea, I should not despise thee. I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house, who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand should be under my head, and his right hand should embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love, until he please. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raise thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. We have a little sister, and she hath no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? If she be a wall, we will build upon her a palace of silver. And if she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I am a wall, and my breasts like towers. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favour. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hammon. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand, and those that keep the fruit thereof two hundred. Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions hearken to thy voice, cause me to hear it. Make haste, my beloved and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. End of Book 22 Song of Solomon by Anonymous That Little Square Vox by Arthur Conan Doyle 1859-1930 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. All aboard, said the captain. All aboard, sir, said the mate. Then stand by to let her go. It was nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning. The good ship Spartan was lying off Boston Quay with her cargo under hatches. Her passengers shipped, and everything prepared for a start. The warning whistle had been sounded twice. The final bell had been rung. Her bowsprit was turned towards England, and the hiss of escaping steam showed that all was ready for her run of three thousand miles. She strained at the warts that held her like a greyhound at its leash. I have the misfortune to be a very nervous man. A sedentary literary life had helped to increase the morbid love of solitude 
which, even in my boyhood, was one of my distinguishing characteristics. As I stood upon the quarter-deck of the transatlantic steamer, I bitterly cursed the necessity which drove me back to the land of my forefathers. The shouts of the sailors, the rattle of the cordage, the farewells of my fellow passengers, and the cheers of the mob, each and all jarred upon my sensitive nature. I felt sad, too, an indescribable feeling, as of some impending calamity, seemed to haunt me. The sea was calm, and the breeze light. There was nothing to disturb the equanimity of the most confirmed of landsmen. Yet I felt as if I stood upon the verge of a great, though indefinable, danger. I have noticed that such presentiments occur often in men of my peculiar temperament, and that they are not uncommonly fulfilled. There is a theory that it arises from a species of second sight, a subtle spiritual communication with the future. I remember that Herr Rohmer, the eminent spiritualist, remarked on one occasion that I was the most sensitive subject as regards supernatural phenomena that he had ever encountered in the whole of his wide experience. Be that as it may, I certainly felt far from happy as I threaded my way among the weeping, cheering groups which dotted the white decks of the good ship Spartan. Had I known the experience which awaited me in the course of the next twelve hours, I should even then at the last moment have sprung upon the shore and made my escape from the accursed vessel. Time's up, said the captain, closing his chronometer with a snap and replacing it in his pocket. Time's up! said the mate. There was a last wail from the whistle, a rush of friends and relatives upon the land. One warp was loosened, the gangway was being pushed away, when there was a shout from the bridge, and two men appeared, running rapidly down the quay. They were waving their hands and making frantic gestures, apparently with the intention of stopping the ship. Look sharp, shouted the crowd. Hold hard, cried the captain. Ease her. Stop her. Up with the gangway. And the two men sprang aboard just as the second warp parted, and the convulsive throb of the engine shot us clear of the shore. There was a cheer from the deck, another from the quay, a mighty fluttering of handkerchiefs, and the great vessel ploughed its way out of the harbour and steamed grandly away across the placid bay. We were fairly started upon our fortnight's voyage. There was a general dive among the passengers in quest of berths and luggage, while a popping of corks in the saloon proved that more than one bereaved traveller was adopting artificial means for drowning the pangs of separation. I glanced round the deck and took a running inventory of my companions de voyage. They presented the usual types met with upon these occasions. There was no striking face among them. I speak as a connoisseur, for faces are a speciality of mine. I pounce upon a characteristic feature as a botanist does on a flower, and bear it away with me to analyse at my leisure, and classify and label it in my little anthropological museum. There was nothing worthy of me here, twenty types of young America going to Europe, a few respectable middle-aged couples as an antidote, a sprinkling of clergymen and professional men, young ladies, bagmen, British exclusives, and all the ola podrida of an ocean-going steamer. I turned away from them and gazed back at the receding shores of America, and, as a cloud of remembrances rose before me, my heart warmed towards the land of my adoption. A pile of portmanteaus and luggage chanced to be lying on the side of the deck, awaiting their turn to be taken below. With my usual love for solitude I walked behind these, and sitting on a coil of rope between them and the vessel's side, I indulged in a melancholy reverie. I was aroused from this by a whisper behind me. "'Here's a quiet place,' said the voice. "'Sit down and we can talk it over in safety.' Glancing through a chink between two colossal chests, 
I saw that the passengers who had joined us at the last moment were standing at the other side of the pile. They had evidently failed to see me as I crouched in the shadow of the boxes. The one who had spoken was a tall and very thin man, with a blue-black beard and a colourless face. His manner was nervous and excited. His companion was a short, plethoric little fellow, with a brisk and resolute air. He had a cigar in his mouth and a large ulster slung over his left arm. They both glanced round uneasily, as if to ascertain whether they were alone. "'This is just the place,' I heard the other say. They sat down on a bale of goods, with their backs turned towards me, and I found myself, much against my will, playing the unpleasant part of an eavesdropper to their conversation. "'Well, Muller,' said the taller of the two, "'we've got it aboard right enough.' "'Yes,' assented the man whom he had addressed as Muller. "'It's safe aboard.' "'It was rather a near go.' "'It was that, Flanagan. "'It wouldn't have done to have missed the ship. "'No, it would have put our plans out.' "'Ruined them entirely,' said the little man, "'and puffed furiously at his cigar for some minutes. "'I've got it here,' he said at last. "'Let me see it. "'Is no one looking?' No, they are nearly all below. We can't be too careful where so much is at stake, said Muller, as he uncalled the ulster which hung over his arm, and disclosed a dark object which he laid upon the deck. One glance at it was enough to cause me to spring to my feet with an exclamation of horror. Luckily they were so engrossed in the matter on hand that neither of them observed me. Had they turned their heads, they would have infallibly have seen my pale face glaring at them over the pile of boxes. From the first moment of their conversation, a horrible misgiving had come over me. It seemed more than confirmed as I gazed at what lay before me. It was a little square box made of some dark wood and ribbed with brass. I suppose it was about the size of a cubic foot. It reminded me of a pistol case only it was decidedly higher. There was an appendage to it, however, on which my eyes were riveted, and which suggested the pistol itself rather than its receptacle. This was a trigger-like arrangement upon the lid, to which a coil of string was attached. Beside this trigger there was a small square aperture through the wood. The tall man, Flanagan, as his companion called him, applied his eye to this and peered in for several minutes with an expression of intense anxiety upon his face. "'It seems right enough,' he said at last. "'I tried not to shake it,' said his companion. "'Such delicate things need delicate treatment. "'Put in some of the needful, Muller.' The shorter man fumbled in his pocket for some time, and then produced a small paper packet. He opened this and took out of it half a handful of whitish granules, which he poured down through the hole. A curious clicking noise followed from the inside of the box, and both the men smiled in a satisfied way. "'Nothing much wrong there,' said Flanagan. "'Right as a trivet,' answered his companion. "'Look out! Here's someone coming. Take it down to our berth. It wouldn't do to have anyone suspecting what our game is, or, worse still, have them fumbling with it and letting it off by mistake.' "'Well, it would come to the same, whoever let it off,' said Muller. "'They'd be rather astonished if they pulled the trigger,' said the taller, with a sinister laugh. "'Ha, ha, ha! Fancy their faces! It's not a bad bit of workmanship. I flatter myself.' "'No,' said Muller. "'I hear it is your own design. Every bit of it, isn't it? "'Yes, the spring and the sliding shutter are my own. "'We should take out a patent.' and the two men laughed again with a cold, harsh laugh as they took up the little brass-bound package and concealed it in Muller's voluminous overcoat. "'Come down and we'll stow it in our berth,' said Flanagan. "'We won't need it until tonight, and it will be safe there.' His companion assented, and the two went arm in arm along the deck and disappeared down the hatchway, bearing the mysterious little box away with them. 
The last words I heard were a muttered injunction from Flanagan to carry it carefully and avoid knocking it against the bulwarks. How long I remained sitting on that coil of rope, I shall never know. The horror of the conversation I had just overheard was aggravated by the first sinking qualms of seasickness. The long roll of the Atlantic was beginning to assert itself over both ship and passengers. I felt prostrated in mind and in body, and fell into a state of collapse, from which I was finally aroused by the hearty voice of our worthy quartermaster. "'Do you mind moving out of that, sir?' he said. "'We want to get this lumber cleared off the deck.' His bluff manner and ruddy, healthy face seemed to be a positive insult to me in my present condition. Had I been a courageous or a muscular man, I could have struck him. As it was, I treated the honest sailor to a melodramatic scowl, which seemed to cause him no small astonishment, and strode past him to the other side of the deck. Solitude was what I wanted, solitude in which I could brood over the frightful crime which was being hatched before my very eyes. One of the quarter-boats was hanging rather low down upon the davits. An idea struck me, and climbing on the bulwarks, I stepped into the empty boat and lay down on the bottom of it. Stretched on my back, with nothing but the blue sky above me, and an occasional view of the mizzen as the vessel rolled, I was at least alone with my sickness and my thoughts. I tried to recall the words which had been spoken in the terrible dialogue I had overheard. Would they admit of any construction but the one which stared me in the face? My reason forced me to confess that they would not. I endeavoured to array the various facts which formed the chain of circumstantial evidence, and to find a flaw in it. But no, not a link was missing. There was the strange way in which our passengers had come aboard enabling them to evade any examination of their luggage. The very name of Flanagan smacked of Fenianism, while Muller suggested nothing but socialism and murder. Then their mysterious manner, their remark that their plans would have been ruined had they missed a ship, their fear of being observed, last but not least, the clenching evidence in the production of the little square box with the trigger, and their grim joke about the face of the man who should let it off by mistake. Could these facts lead to any conclusion other than that they were the desperate emissaries of some body, political or otherwise, who intended to sacrifice themselves, their fellow passengers, and the ship, in one great holocaust? The whitest granules which I had seen one of them pour into the box formed no doubt a fuse, or train for exploding it. I had myself heard a sound come from it which might have emanated from some delicate piece of machinery. But what did they mean by their allusion to tonight? Could it be that they contemplated putting their horrible design into execution on the very first evening of our voyage? The mere thought of it sent a cold shudder over me and made me for a moment superior even to the agonies of seasickness. I have remarked that I am a physical coward, I am a moral one also. It is seldom that the two defects are united to such a degree in the one character. I have known many men who were most sensitive to bodily danger, and yet were distinguished for their independence and strength of their minds. In my own case, however, I regret to say that my quiet and retiring habits had fostered a nervous dread of doing anything remarkable or making myself conspicuous, which exceeded, if possible, my fear of personal peril. An ordinary mortal placed under the circumstances in which I now found myself would have gone at once to the captain, confessed his fears, and put the matter into his hands. To me, however, constituted as I am, the idea was most repugnant. The thought of becoming the observed of all observers, cross-questioned by a stranger, and confronted with two desperate conspirators, in the character of a denouncer, was hateful to me. Might it not by some remote possibility prove that I was mistaken? What would be my feelings if there should turn out to be no grounds for my accusation? No, I would procrastinate. 
I would keep my eye on the two desperados and dog them at every turn. Anything was better than the possibility of being wrong. Then it struck me, even at that moment, some new phase of the conspiracy might be developing itself. The nervous excitement seemed to have driven away my incipient attack of sickness, for I was able to stand up and lower myself from the boat, without experiencing any return of it. I staggered along the deck with the intention of descending into the cabin and finding how my acquaintances of the morning were occupying themselves. Just as I had my hand on the companion rail, I was astonished by receiving a hearty slap on the back which nearly shot me down the steps with more haste than dignity. "'Is that you, Hammond?' said a voice which I seemed to recognise. "'God bless me,' I said, as I turned round. "'It can't be Dick Merton. "'Why, how are you, old man?' This was an unexpected piece of luck in the midst of my perplexities. Dick was just the man I wanted, kindly and shrewd in his nature— and prompt in his actions. I should have no difficulty in telling him my suspicions, and could rely upon his sound sense to point out the best course to pursue. Since I was a little lad in the second form at Harrow, Dick had been my adviser and protector. He saw at a glance that something had gone wrong with me. Hallo, he said in his kindly way. What put you about, Hammond? You look as white as a sheet. Mal de mer, eh? "'No, not that altogether,' said I. "'Walk up and down with me, Dick. I want to speak to you. Give me your arm.' Supporting myself on Dick's stalwart frame, I tottered along by his side, but it was some time before I could muster resolution to speak. "'Have a cigar,' said he, breaking the silence. "'No, thanks,' said I. "'Dick, we shall be all corpses to-night.' "'That's no reason against your having a cigar now,' said Dick, in his cool way, but looking hard at me from under his shaggy eyebrows as he spoke. He evidently thought that my intellect was a little gone. Now I continued, it's no laughing matter, and I speak in sober earnest, I assure you. I have discovered an infamous conspiracy, Dick, to destroy this ship and every soul that is in her. And I then proceeded systematically and in order to lay before him the chain of evidence which I had collected. There, Dick, I said as I concluded, what do you think of that? And above all, what am I to do? To my astonishment he burst into a hearty fit of laughter. I'd be frightened, he said, if any fellow but you had told me as much. You always had a way, Hammond, of discovering mare's nest. I like to see the old traits breaking out again. Do you remember at school how you swore there was a ghost in the long room, and how it turned out to be your own reflection in the mirror? Why, man, he continued, what object would any one have in destroying this ship? We have no great political guns aboard. On the contrary, the majority of the passengers are Americans. Besides, in this sober nineteenth century, the most wholesale murderers stop at including themselves among their victims. Depend upon it, you have misunderstood them, and have mistaken a photographic camera, or something equally innocent, for an infernal machine. Nothing of the sort, sir, said I, rather touchily. You will learn to your cost, I fear, that I have neither exaggerated nor misinterpreted a word. As to the box, I have certainly never before seen one like it. It contained delicate machinery, of that I am convinced, from the way in which the men handled it and spoke of it. "'You'd make out every packet of perishable goods to be a torpedo,' said Dick, "'if that is to be your only test.' "'The man's name was Flanagan,' I continued. "'I don't think that would go very far in a court of law,' said Dick. "'But come, I have finished my cigar. Suppose we go down together and split a bottle of claret. You can point out these two Orsinis to me,' if they are still in the cabin. All right, I answered. I am determined not to lose sight of them all day. Don't look hard at them, though, for I don't want them to think that they are being watched. Trust me, said Dick, I'll look as unconscious and guileless as a lamb. 
and with that we passed down the companion and into the saloon. A good many passengers were scattered about the great central table, some wrestling with refractory carpet bags and rug straps, some having their luncheon, and a few reading and otherwise amusing themselves. The objects of our quest were not there. We passed down the room and peered into every berth, but there was no sign of them. Heavens, thought I, perhaps at this very moment they are beneath our feet in the hold or engine room, preparing their diabolical contrivance. It was better to know the worst than to remain in such suspense. Steward, said Dick, are there any other gentlemen about? There's two in the smoking room, sir, answered the steward. The smoking room was a little snuggery, luxuriously fitted up and adjoining the pantry. We pushed the door open and entered. A sigh of relief escaped from my bosom. The very first thing on which my eye rested was the cadaverous face of Flanagan, with its hard-set mouth and unwinking eye. His companion sat opposite him. They were both drinking, and a pile of cards lay upon the table. They were engaged in playing as we entered. I nudged Dick to show him that we had found our quarry, and we sat down beside them with an unconcerned an air as possible. The two conspirators seemed to take little notice of our presence. I watched them both narrowly. The game at which they were playing was Napoleon. Both were adepts at it, and I could not help admiring the consummate nerve of men who, with such a secret at their hearts, could devote their minds to the manipulating of a long suit or the finessing of a queen. Money changed hands rapidly, but the run of luck seemed to be all against the taller of the two players. At last he threw down his cards on the table with an oath and refused to go on. No, I'm hanged if I do, he said. I haven't had more than two of a suit for five hands. Never mind, said his comrade, as he gathered up his winnings. A few dollars one way or the other won't go very far after tonight's work. I was astonished at the rascal's audacity, but took care to keep my eyes fixed abstractedly upon the ceiling, and drank my wine in an unconscious a manner as possible. I felt that Flanagan was looking towards me with his wolfish eyes, to see if I had noticed the illusion. He whispered something to his companion, which I failed to catch. It was a caution, I suppose, for the other answered rather angrily, "'Nonsense! Why shouldn't I say what I like?' Over-caution is just what would ruin us. I believe you want it not to come off, said Flanagan. You believe nothing of the sort, said the other, speaking rapidly and loudly. You know as well as I do that when I play for a stake I like to win it, but I won't have my words criticised and cut short by you or any other man. I have as much interest in our success as you have. More, I hope. He was quite hot about it and puffed furiously at his cigar for some minutes. The eyes of the other ruffian wandered alternately from Dick Merton to myself. I knew that I was in the presence of a desperate man, that a quiver of my lip might be the signal for him to plunge a weapon into my heart. But I betrayed more self-command than I should have given myself credit for under such trying circumstances. As to Dick, he was as immovable and apparently as unconscious as the Egyptian Sphinx. There was silence for some time in the smoking room, broken only by the crisp rattle of the cards, as the man Muller shuffled them up before replacing them in his pocket. He still seemed to be somewhat flushed and irritable. Throwing the end of his cigar into the spittoon, he glanced defiantly at his companion and turned towards me. "'Can you tell me, sir,' he said, "'when this ship will be heard of again?' They were both looking at me, but though my face may have turned a trifle paler, my voice was as steady as ever as I answered. "'I presume, sir, that it will be heard of first "'when it enters Queenstown Harbour.' "'Ha, ha, ha!' laughed the angry little man. "'I knew you would say that. "'Don't you kick me under the table, Flanagan. "'I won't stand for it. "'I know what I am doing. "'You are wrong, sir.' he continued, turning to me. Utterly wrong. Some passing ship, perhaps, suggested Dick. No, nor that either. The weather is fine, I said. Why should we not be heard of at our destination? I didn't say we shouldn't be heard of at our destination. Possibly we may not, and in any case that is not where we shall be heard of first. Where, then? asked Dick. 
that you shall never know suffice it that a rapid and mysterious agency will signal our whereabouts and that before the day is out ha ha and he chuckled once again come on deck growled his comrade you have drunk too much of that confounded brandy and water it has loosened your tongue come away and taking him by the arm he half led him half forced him out of the smoking room and we heard them stumbling up the companion together and on to the deck well what do you think now i gasped as i turned towards dick he was as imperturbable as ever think he said why i think that his companion thinks that we have been listening to the ravings of a half-drunken man the fellow stunk of brandy nonsense dick i saw how the other tried to stop his tongue of course he did he didn't want his friend to make a fool of himself before strangers maybe the short one is a lunatic and the other his private keeper it's quite possible oh dick dick i cried how can you be so blind don't you see that every word confirmed our previous suspicion humbug man said dick you're working yourself into a state of nervous excitement why what the devil do you make of all that nonsense about a mysterious agent which would signal our whereabouts i'll tell you what he meant dick i said bending forward and grasping my friend's arm he meant a sudden glare and a flash seen far out at sea by some lonely fisherman off the american coast that's what he meant i didn't think you were such a fool hammond said dick merton testily if you try to fix a literal meaning on the twaddle that every drunken man talks you will come to some queer conclusions let us follow their example and go on deck you need fresh air i think depend upon it your liver is out of order a sea voyage will do you a world of good if i ever see the end of this one i groaned i'll promise never to venture on another they are laying the cloth so it's hardly worth while my going up i'll stay below and unpack my things i hope dinner will find you in a more pleasant state of mind said dick and he went out leaving me to my thoughts until the clang of the great gong summoned us to the saloon my appetite i need hardly say had not been improved by the incidents which had occurred during the day i sat down however mechanically at the table and listened to the talk which was going on around me there were nearly a hundred first-class passengers and as the wine began to circulate their voices combined with the clash of the dishes to form a perfect babel i found myself seated between a very stout and nervous old lady and a prim little clergyman and as neither made any advances i retired into my shell and spent my time in observing the appearance of my fellow voyagers i could see dick in the dim distance dividing his attention between a jointless file in front of him and a self-possessed young lady at his side captain dowie was doing the honours at my end while the surgeon of the vessel was seated at the other i was glad to notice that flanagan was placed almost opposite to me as long as i had him before my eyes i knew that for some time at least we were safe he was sitting with what was meant to be a sociable smile on his grim face it did not escape me that he drank largely of wine so largely that even before the dessert appeared his voice had become decidedly husky his friend muller was seated a few places lower down he ate little and appeared to be nervous and restless now ladies said our genial captain i trust that you will consider yourselves at home aboard my vessel i have no fears for the gentleman a bottle of champagne steward here's to a fresh breeze and a quick passage i trust our friends in america will hear of our safe arrival in eight days or nine at the very latest i looked up quick as was the glance which passed between flanagan and his confederate i was able to intercept it there was an evil smile upon the former's thin lips the conversation rippled on politics the sea amusements religion each was in turn discussed i remained a silent though interested listener it struck me that no harm could be done by introducing the subject which was ever in my mind it could be managed in an off-hand way and would at least have the effect of turning the captain's thoughts in that direction i could watch too what effect it would have upon the faces of the conspirators 
There was a sudden lull in the conversation. The ordinary subjects of interest appeared to be exhausted. The opportunity was a favourable one. "'May I ask, Captain,' I said, bending forward and speaking very distinctly, "'what you think of Fenian manifestos?' The captain's ruddy face became a shade darker from honest indignation. "'They are poor cowardly things,' he said, "'as silly as they are wicked. "'The impotent threats of a set of anonymous scoundrels,' said a pompous-looking old gentleman beside him. "'Oh, captain,' said the fat lady at my side, "'you don't really think they would blow up a ship?' "'I have no doubt they would if they could, "'but I am very sure they should never blow up mine.' "'May I ask what precautions are taken against them?' "'asked an elderly man at the end of the table. "'All goods sent aboard this ship are strictly examined,' said Captain Dowie. "'But suppose a man brought explosives with him?' I suggested. "'They are too cowardly to risk their own lives in that way.' "'During this conversation, Flanagan had not betrayed the slightest interest in what was going on. "'He raised his head now and looked at the captain.' "'Don't you think you are rather underrating them?' he said. "'Every secret society has produced desperate men. "'Why shouldn't the Fenians have them too? "'Many men think it a privilege to die in the service of a cause "'which seems right in their eyes, though others may think it wrong. "'Indiscriminate murder cannot be right in anybody's eyes,' said the little clergyman. "'The bombardment of Paris was nothing else,' said Flanagan, yet the whole civilised world agreed to look on with folded arms and change the ugly word murder into the more euphonious one of war. It seemed right enough to Germanize. Why shouldn't dynamite seem to be so to the Fenian? At any rate, their empty vaporings have led to nothing as yet, said the captain. Excuse me, returned Flanagan, but is there not some room for doubt yet as to the fate of the dotterel? I've met men in America who have asserted from their own personal knowledge that there was a coral torpedo aboard that vessel. Then they lied, said the captain. It was proved conclusively at the court-martial to have arisen from an explosion of coal gas, but we had better change the subject or we may cause the ladies to have a restless night. And the conversation once more drifted back into its original channel. During this little discussion, Flanagan had argued his point with a gentlemanly deference and a quiet power for which I had not given him credit. I could not help admiring a man who, on the eve of a desperate enterprise, could courteously argue upon a point which must touch him so nearly. He had, as I have already mentioned, partaken of a considerable quantity of wine, but though there was a slight flush upon his pale cheek, his manner was as reserved as ever. He did not join in the conversation again, but seemed to be lost in thought. A whirl of conflicting ideas was battling in my own mind. What was I to do? Should I stand up now and denounce them before both passengers and captain? Should I demand a few minutes' conversation with the latter in his own cabin and reveal it all? For an instant I was half resolved to do it, but then the old constitutional timidity came back with redoubled force. After all, there might be some mistake. Dick had heard the evidence and had refused to believe in it. I determined to let things go on their course. A strange, reckless feeling came over me, why should I help men who were blind to their own danger? Sure it was the duty of the officers to protect us, not ours to give warning to them. I drank off a couple of glasses of wine and staggered upon deck with the determination of keeping my secret locked in my own bosom. It was a glorious evening. Even in my excited state of mind I could not help leaning against the bulwarks and enjoying the refreshing breeze. Away to the westward a solitary sail stood out as a dark speck against the great sheet of flame left by the setting sun. I shuddered as I looked at it. It was grand but appalling. A single star was twinkling faintly above our mainmast, but a thousand seemed to gleam in the water below with every stroke of our propeller. The only blot in the fair scene was the great trail 
of smoke which stretched away behind us like a black slash upon a crimson curtain. It was hard to believe that the great peace which hung over all nature could be marred by a poor, miserable mortal. After all, I thought, as I gazed into the blue depths beneath me, if the worst comes to the worst, it is better to die here than to linger in agony upon the sick bed on land. A man's life seems a very paltry thing amid the great forces of nature. All my philosophy could not prevent my shuddering, however, when I turned my head and saw two shadowy figures at the side of the deck which I had no difficulty in recognising. They seemed to be conversing earnestly, but I had no opportunity of overhearing what was said, so I contented myself with the pacing up and down and keeping a vigilant watch upon their movements. It was a relief to me when Dick came on deck. Even an incredulous confidant is better than none at all. Well, old man, he said, giving me a facetious dig in the ribs, we've not been blown up yet. No, not yet, said I, but that's no proof that we are not going to be. Nonsense, man, said Dick. I can't conceive what has put this extraordinary idea into your head. I've been talking to one of your supposed assassins, and he seems a pleasant fellow enough, quite a sporting character, I should think, from the way he speaks. Dick, I said, I am as certain that those men have an infernal machine and that we are on the verge of eternity, as if I saw them putting the match to the fuse. Well, if you really think so, said Dick, half awed for the moment by the earnestness of my manner, it is your duty to let the captain know of your suspicions. You are right, I said, I will. My absurd timidity has prevented my doing so sooner. I believe our lives can only be saved by laying the whole matter before him. Well, go and do it now, said Dick, but for goodness sake don't mix me up in the matter. I'll speak to him when he comes off the bridge, I answered, and in the meantime I don't mean to lose sight of them. Let me know of the result, said my companion, and with a nod he strolled away in search, I fancy, of his partner at the dinner table. Left to myself, I bethought me of my treat of the morning, and climbing into the bulwark, I mounted into the quarter-boat and lay down there. In it I could reconsider my course of action, and by raising my head I was able to, at any time, to get a view of my disagreeable neighbours. An hour passed, and the captain was still on the bridge. He was talking to one of the passengers, a retired naval officer, and the two were deep in debate concerning some obtruse point in navigation. I could see the red tips of their cigars from where I lay. It was dark now, so dark that I could hardly make out the figures of Flanagan and his accomplice. They were still standing in the position which they had taken up after dinner. A few of the passengers were scattered about the deck, but many had gone below. A strange stillness seemed to pervade the air. The voices of the watch and the rattle of the wheel were the only sounds which broke the silence. Another half hour passed, the captain was still upon the bridge. It seemed as if he would never come down. My nerves were in a state of unnatural tension, so much so that the sound of two steps upon the deck made me start up in a quiver of excitement. I peered over the edge of the boat and saw that our suspicious passengers had crossed from the other side and were standing almost directly beneath me. The light of a binnacle fell upon the ghastly face of the ruffian Flanagan. Even in that short glance I saw that Muller had the ulster, whose use I knew so well, slung loosely over his arm. I sank back with a groan. It seemed that my fatal procrastination had sacrificed two hundred innocent lives. I had read of the fiendish vengeance which awaited a spy. I knew that men with their lives in their hands would stick at nothing. All I could do was to cower at the bottom of the boat and listen silently to their whispered talk below. This place will do, said a voice. Yes, the leeward side is best. I wonder if the trigger will act. I am sure it will. We were to let it off at ten, were we not? Yes, at ten sharp. We have eight minutes yet. There was a pause. Then the voice began again. They'll hear the drop of the trigger, won't they? It doesn't matter. It will be too late for anyone to prevent it going off. 
That's true. There will be some excitement among those we have left behind, won't there? Rather, how long do you reckon it will be before they hear of us? The first news will get in at about midnight at earliest. That will be my doing. No, mine. Ha ha ha, we'll settle that. There was a pause here, then I heard Muller's voice in a ghastly whisper. There's only five minutes more. How slowly the moments seemed to pass. I could count them by the throbbing of my heart. It'll make a sensation on land, said a voice. Yes, it will make a noise in the newspapers. I raised my head and peered over the side of the boat. There seemed no hope, no help. Death stared me in the face, whether I did or did not give the alarm. The captain had at last left the bridge. The deck was deserted, save for those two dark figures, crouching in the shadow of the boat. Flanagan had a watch lying open in his hand. Three minutes more, he said. Put it down upon the deck. No, put it here on the bulwarks. It was the little square box. I knew by the sound that they had placed it near the davit, and almost exactly under my head. I looked over again. Flanagan was pouring something out of a paper into his hand. It was white and granular, the same that I had seen him use in the morning. It was meant as a fuse, no doubt, for he shoveled it into the little box, and I heard the strange noise which had previously arrested my attention. A minute and a half more, he said. Shall you or I pull the string? I will pull it, said Muller. He was kneeling down and holding the end in his hand. Flanagan stood behind with his arms folded and an air of grim resolution upon his face. I could stand it no longer. My nervous system seemed to give way in a moment. Stop! I screamed, springing to my feet. Stop, misguided and unprincipled men! They both staggered backwards. I fancy they thought I was a spirit, with the moonlight streaming down upon my pale face. I was brave enough now. I'd gone too far to retreat. Cain was damned, I cried, and he slew but one. Would you have the blood of two hundred upon your souls? He's mad, said Flanagan. Time's up. Let it off, Muller. I sprang down upon the deck. You shan't do it, I said. By what right do you prevent us? By every right, human and divine. It's no business of yours. Clear out of this. Never, said I. Confound the fellow. There's too much at stake to stand on ceremony. I'll hold him, Muller, while you pull the trigger. Next moment I was struggling in the Herculean grasp of the Irishman. Resistance was useless. I was a child in his hands. He pinned me against the side of the vessel and held me there. Now, he said, look sharp, he can't prevent us. I felt that I was standing on the verge of eternity. Half strangled in the arms of the taller ruffian, I saw the other approach the fatal box. He stooped over it and seized the string. I breathed one prayer when I saw his grasp tighten upon it. Then came a sharp snap, a strange rasping noise. The trigger had fallen, the side of the box flew out, and let off two grey carrier pigeons. Little more need be said. It is not a subject on which I care to dwell. The whole thing is too utterly disgusting and absurd. Perhaps the best thing I can do is to retire gracefully from the scene and let the sporting correspondent of the New York Herald fill my unworthy place. Here is an extract clipped from its columns shortly after our departure from America. Pigeon flying. Extraordinary. A novel match has been brought off last week between the birds of John H. Flanagan of Boston and Jeremiah Muller, a well-known citizen of Lowell. Both men have devoted much time and attention to an improved breed of bird, and a challenge is an old standing one. The pigeons were backed to a large amount, and there was considerable local interest in the result. The start was from the deck of the transatlantic steamer Spartan at ten o'clock on the evening of the day of starting, the vessel being then reckoned to be about a hundred miles from the land. The bird which reached home first was to be declared the winner. Considerable caution had, we believe, to be observed, as some captains have a prejudice against the bringing off of sporting events aboard their vessels. In spite of some little difficulty at the last moment, the trap was sprung almost exactly at ten o'clock. 
Muller's bird arrived in Lowell in an extreme state of exhaustion on the following morning, while Flanagan's has not been heard of. The backers of the latter have the satisfaction of knowing, however, that the whole affair has been characterised by extreme fairness. The pigeons were confined in a specially invented trap which could only be opened by the spring. It was thus possible to feed them through an aperture in the top, but any tampering with their wings was quite out of the question. A few such matches would go far towards popularising pigeon flying in America and form an agreeable variety to the morbid exhibitions of human endurance which have assumed such proportions during the last few years. End of That Little Square Vox by Arthur Conan Doyle Recording by Peter Tomlinson